turning. And when I switched over, it just wouldn't come up. So I am so sorry that it took me so long to get on. That's ridiculous because it's been on all morning. All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Hope everyone's doing well. All right. We have everybody on board, Herman? Yep. All right. Good. Um, yep. I see all those happy faces out there. All right. So let's start off number with the first project is um, with Jared and Neil on the Eisenhower Johnson Tunnel. Are we ready? Yes, uh, Jennifer, if you could load up the presentation. Thank you. All right, everybody, um, as you know, I'm with Project Support and specifically today representing the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise. Um, where this is a follow-up workshop. You've seen us uh, in November and December workshops, but today we're going to be focusing in on the areas of need for the tunnel asset class. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, today we'll discuss kind of three categories. Of oh, so oh. Sorry, Neil, oh, I, still, I still have another one. Can you go back one slide, uh, Jennifer? All right, so um, through the collaboration of CDOT's uh, subject matter experts, including Neil Retzer, who's here today, the um, executive steering committee that was stood up here this fall to address the tunnel's needs, um, the EJMT repair and maintenance backlog has been identified as the highest priority of the tunnel asset class. Uh, that need is captured in the 10-year plan, and in total, it is identified for EJMT to be about $150 million. Um, assuming that you know, we're, we're taking on the, the understanding that the primary goal of Senate Bill 260 legislation for tunnels is for the EJMT, $50 million has already been uh, allocated in advance for the first tier of projects in accordance with the 10-year plan. The new uh, bridge and tunnel impact in retail delivery fees over the next 10 years is going to be viewed as the best option to address the remaining $100 million of unfunded projects. And now with that, I'll hand it over to Neil Retzer. He's a subject matter expert for tunnels and the resident engineer responsible for overseeing the uh, projects of EJMT. So with that, I'll hand it over to Neil to talk about what's already ongoing with the tunnel and future projects in need to keep the tunnel in good repair. So uh, with that, go ahead, Neil. Okay, so um, I think I, I need to go back to that other slide I started talking on uh, back, okay. So we got four, four categories, of, or I'm sorry, three categories of projects that we'll talk about today. Um, and all, all those will equal the $150 million that Jared was just referring to. So the current SB 260 projects, all those together, they equal $50 million. So um, when, when we rolled out that project list, we got a little bit of pushback um, from some people. And they a lot of people wanted to, to tackle the, the easy kind of low-hanging fruit projects like new LED lighting. But... Um, Really, we need to do some housekeeping items in there first with these SB 260 projects. So our cr criteria for those projects was safety first. So if it was something that could um, injure someone in the tunnel, either either an employee or a, a motorist, then, then it made the list. If it's doing damage to other parts of the tunnel, like it's leaking onto other parts of the tunnel, then that made the list. Or if it can suddenly close the tunnel for an unexpected reason, then that project made the list. So that's how we came up with those SB 260 projects. So also in discuss what they include, um, how much they cost, and then uh, at the very end, we'll talk about a, a timeline of when they'll all be delivered. And then we also have this category of planned but unfunded projects. I call these the cans that keep getting kicked down the road. So we do have a very good idea or a rough scope of what we need to do in a pretty high level cost estimate. I'll, I'll explain those projects a little bit later and, and why they keep getting kicked down the road. 
Um, then our last category is unplanned and unfunded projects. So these are projects that are really good ideas. We just haven't totally formulated them or we haven't gotten the green light on them from anybody. And some of these are coming from like um, the hazmat study that we recently completed. Uh, next slide. So here's the list of all the SB 260 projects. It does add a little over $50 million. Um, we'll probably supplement that with uh, current tunnel asset management um, to, to meet that shortcoming. But these are, these are all the projects that we have um, proposed with that money. So we can go ahead and go through the, the slides for these. So first one is that $24 million um, plumbing project. Essentially, this is improving and updating and uh, in some cases, abandoning and replacing some of our plumbing systems up there. So you'll see this picture on the, the right. Um, that's actually a, a clogged seep pipe. Uh, it got clogged with ice made almost uh, two years ago. And then the result is um, all this water that started heaving the road up. And we had to cut this hole in the road and relieve all that pressure from all that water. Um, this other picture here, that's our water treatment plant that's still for the most part original, it's almost 50 years old. Um, so there's some updates we need to do that. Um, some other uh, upgrades are the generators and the uh, 600 horsepower fan motors for the North Tunnel. So next slide. So on the left, that is uh, one of the two original generators for EJMT. Um, they don't really do much. Um, they, they will power every seventh light and maybe one fan on low speed, which in an emergency does not do anything for us. So um, that project will replace those two with one diesel generator on the west side so that the, the tunnel can operate as normally if the power goes out on both sides of the tunnel. Uh, the right side, that is what we are relying on to keep the um, main water line in the south tunnel thawed. So that is some house insulation and some electrical uh, heat tape that is running along that pipe to keep that thing thawed. And it, it has failed before. Uh, next slide. Our next project's a $10 million um, liner repair. So the, the liner of the tunnel is essentially like the roof or the structure uh, of the tunnel. And um, it, it, it serves two purposes. It, it's supposed to keep water out of the tunnel. It's also supposed to keep uh, rocks from um, falling into the tunnel. So you'll see uh, some pictures here on the left. That's some uh, calcium deposits getting into the tunnel. The center picture, all that white is actually ice that's built up um, in the winter. And then the, the darker areas is what's been thawed out and that we're trying to redirect into the drains. Um, this ice is built up as much as two feet on the, the ceiling before, which is extremely unsafe. It's not designed to hold that load. Uh, picture on the right, I, I didn't want to put a video in here, but hopefully this illustrates that's water that's actually running through the, the liner. That's almost like a, a water feature. Um, and then I've got a picture at the end that shows you kind of the end result of where that water ends up. So next slide. Um, we've got another project for $2 million. So as you drive through the tunnel, you see these like uh, tiles and wall panels. Um, and essentially those are large eight foot wide wall panels. And what happens is that water from up above gets down below and it freezes and it'll actually push those wall panels out. Um, extremely unsafe situation. They're not designed in any way to move like that. Um, it also deteriorates all the grout that um, those wall panels are resting on. So the project is going to remove, reset, and possibly replace all of the shifted wall panels and then also regrout um, everything underneath the, the wall panels that needs to be replaced. Next slide. Uh, next. Did I go mute? I can hear you. Oh, okay. 
while we're waiting for the next slide, this is scary stuff. <laughs> this really is, it's really. Yeah, some of it can be pretty, pretty dangerous. Um, there we go. Um, so we also have a, we're calling it the service area repairs project. It, it's essentially taking care of everything um, outside of the tunnels. Um, that includes new pavement for all the, the parking areas and loop roads and service areas, new um, guardrail, um, fixing this brick fascia. It's really sad when you see a 50-year-old iconic structure like this and the brick is, is falling off the front of it. Um, so it's, it's going to repair that. All of our fire extinguisher cabinets inside the tunnel need to be replaced. Um, we're also doing some, uh, I guess you could call them enhancements with this project, a new portal de-icing system. So we can get away from um, people throwing rock salt um, out of the portals to keep it melted. Um, also some sensor upgrades for the outside to try and keep uh, um, things a little safer um, inside the tunnel as far as uh, trying to prevent um, tunnel fires or hazmats from illegally going into the tunnel. Um, uh, next slide. Um, here's some examples of that project. So on the south um, east side of the tunnel, we have this uh, slope that's failing. That's actually between the portal building and Loveland ski area for reference. So that slope's failing. So we'll put some walls there and some better drainage and then uh, resurface all that. Um, center picture, it's another example of the brick falling off the building. It's also a picture of um, a barrier that's now two generations outdated. And then the, your top right's on the northwest side of the tunnel. It's a permanent water feature that we're gonna try and get rid of. So we, we always have a giant puddle of water um, out there. So those are just some examples. Um, we're doing a whole lot more with that project. Uh, next slide. So these are actually, um, this next set of projects are, are property management projects. So th they're a little bit more in their wheelhouse um, plus these are kind of considered occupational spaces. So it's really more in their, their scope and their realm. But the, the first one is um, roof repairs on the west side of the tunnel. So that roof has been leaking pretty bad for several years now. Um, you can kind of see in the upper center, those are icicles that are about four feet long and they're dripping directly onto a 600 horsepower motor. And then that center seam where the arrow is, is actually leaking extremely bad. You can see all the water um, spilling down below onto the bottom. And uh, when it gets really bad, it actually makes its way into the electrical room. And you'll, you know, I, I don't need to go into detail of how water and electricity don't mix. So um, another project they're doing is the vehicle bay ventilation improvements. So all of the, the vehicle bays and the portal buildings um, they currently have CO monitors, so we're going to hook those CO monitors up to fans to, to ventilate um, those vehicle bays safely. And then we also have a, an elevator replacement, possibly repair project for both buildings because we have original, um, I'll just call them out of code uh, elevators in the, the buildings right now. Uh, next pro or Next slide. Uh, the ITS project, so right now I think this one's stuck in a ward. Um, it's actually going to be the first project to go, so hopefully they'll start construction on it here in the next couple months, but it's uh, upgrading the variable message signs, um, also uh, the cameras in the tunnels, as well as the uh, lane usage signals. I think there's also a couple um, signs outside of the tunnel that are getting replaced, so we're, we're chipping in $6 million towards that project and ITS. Is, is covering the other couple million dollars for that one. Uh, next slide. So here's here's those cans that I said are, keep getting kicked down the road for various reasons. I'll just give you an example, like the um, LED lighting upgrade. Everybody wants to do new LED lights up there. And honestly, when I started my role about five years ago, I thought we'd be breaking ground this year on that project, but I, I was kind of naive. I didn't know how many other problems there were up at the tunnel. So this one just hasn't made the list because we have other ones that are just more pressing. All those projects I just talked about, they're huge safety concerns. They're also projects that can immediately shut the tunnel down. So that, that's 
mainly why a lot of these other projects have just been getting moved further and further back is because they're just not they're just not considered that pressing but this is the list of all those projects very much needed just not uh, an identified funding source um next slide so led lighting upgrade so it, it would essentially replace the entire lighting system with LEDs. And um, we need to evaluate right now if we, that includes transformers and other components. But on the left is our current lighting system in, in EJMT. And those are halogen T8 bulbs um, that light the tunnel. And on the right here, um, it's a rendering that's actually from the Ted Williams um, project in Boston. So they, they have very similar lighting to we do. Actually, their tunnel looks almost identical to ours. Um, so on the left is their existing and on the right is what they're going to be installing. They don't, the project's not complete yet. So we're not quite sure what that really looks like, but, um, may, ours, ours might follow suit. Uh, next slide. Um, South tunnel motor upgrade. So we just finished upgrading the North tunnel fans to a uh, variable frequency drives, which is a, a dial instead of a switch, which amounts to huge energy savings as well as um, code compliance. So the left um, fan actually just got that treatment. So the next project is for the right side fans or the south tunnel fans to get the same treatment. Um, essentially it, it increases safety, decreases energy costs. Um, that, that one's gonna be a much larger project. I don't wanna go into the details, but that'll be about a $25 million project as opposed to $10 million for what we just completed. Uh, next slide. Uh, control room. So we still actually have some original components in our control room from the 1970s. Um, so on the left, you'll see a bunch of wires just coming into the control room. That's kind of what happens when you just piecemeal projects over the years. Um, the, the center picture is actually the original control board for all the power in the tunnel. As of September, this is actually just a giant paperweight um, because we've um, digitized this and, and uh, essentially put it, put it on computers and monitors now. So this is essentially needs to be removed. Um, then on the right, all those monitors to the right and on the bottom, those all represent different systems in the tunnel. They're all different. It either represents a fan control, power control, a fixed fire suppression. So what we want to do is unify that into one nice, neat little one or two monitors so that you don't need a swivel chair to run around, especially in an emergency. It makes things extremely dangerous when you have to physically move around to um, address a, an emergency. Uh, next project or next slide, sorry, and next project. Um, so East Burn Culvert Repair. So this is the slide I was talking about. This is the end result of where that all that water ends up. It all ends up down on the roadway in a, a giant mess of ice. So, um, but anyway, the, the East Berm Culvert. So Clear Creek is actually diverted um, around the tunnels. Its natural flow path is actually to go right between the two tunnels. So there's a large berm that diverts it over towards Loveland ski area. And um, we're pretty sure that that berm is leaking like crazy. And that's why you see all this water here. It's directly below that berm and that um, culvert that's directing Clear Creek. Um, so if we repair that, we'll significantly reduce more water, water infiltration into the tunnel. Uh, next slide. Uh, water treatment plant. I know we're doing some of it. Uh, with the plumbing project that I mentioned, but this is um, kind of the next round, the less emergent things that need to happen. Um, plus, we'll, we'd also have to redo some of our permits with Department of Health. So that's going to take a couple years if we do do this project. So that's that's why this one kind of got put on the back burner, not included in the, the previous $24 million project. Uh, next slide. Uh, public address system. So. Um, I don't have any scientific proof of this. I've just watched people act like maniacs during uh, emergency events. So you'd be surprised what people will do, you know, during an emergency. The, the person that was in this uh, black car right here um, was essentially, I don't know what they were trying to do, but they were wandering around in the tunnel while this fire was going, not realizing that they were seconds away from 
dying of smoke inhalation. Um, so we need some sort of address system to start directing people what to do and where to go um, during an emergency event in the tunnel. Um, and then here's some of these uh, unplanned and un unfunded projects um, that, that they're great ideas, but I don't, they're not so pressing, but we could certainly use them down the road to improve the facilities. But that includes adding a, a foaming system to the fixed fire suppression. That's another one that's been recommended by the hazmat study. Um, ceiling repairs and fireproofing. So we may have some systematic failing of the, the ceiling tiles in the north tunnel. Um, so that we're keeping an eye on that one. And then there's all, always various uh, electrical, mechanical and plumbing upgrades. So, um, you know, all, all those projects add up to $150 million that I, I just talked about. Um, but I'm not just the unplanned, unfunded, but I'm talking SB 260 all the way to this slide. So next slide. So here, here's kind of our, our project timeline. Um, you'll see the SB 260 are the first ones and you'll, it's, it's gonna get a little crowded up there um, this summer. Um, that it's kind of what we wanted to point out with this slide. And I, I could certainly, you know, spend the money up there, but it's going to start to turn into a logistical problem if I start sliding a lot of these other projects, like in the next category into mid 2023. So um, I, I just want to say we, we can wait. <laughs> we could use it, but we could also wait because it just turns into a, a problem when you have a two mile stretch of road and two portal buildings and you got to spend $150 million. It, it can't all just fall out of the sky. Um, so that, that's kind of what I wanted to show on this slide. All right, thanks, Neil. I'll take over from here. Uh, this next slide is a 10 year breakdown of the BTE program. Uh, Vice Chair Staten inquired about this. So we kind of wanted to bring this back and go through it a little bit in more detail. So basically that first row is the existing base BTE program. Um, and if you add all of that whole first row together, you get about $1.39 billion. And about half of that or 660 million is already you know, prior program commitments. So about half of that. If you look at that second row that is in green, that basically represents the 500 million of forecasted bridge and tunnel fee revenues for the 10 year uh, plan projects. Um, if you add those two rows together and then subtract kind of the debt service, the central 70 maintenance and operations of the program, you get the bottom row. And that bottom row is about 1.2 billion and over, if you average out each year, you know, kind of you see it goes up over, over the years. On average, it's about 120 million per year. Now, again, about 40% of that is already prior, you know, uh, project commitments. So that basically is kind of a breakdown of the BTE program, old money, new money, money coming in, money going out, and, and money that we have, you know, at the very bottom about 120 million um, per year for the BTE program. Next slide, please. So that takes us to next steps for the program. Uh, the BTE will continue to develop a strategy to utilize the new bridge and tunnel revenues to support the 10 year plan. Um, staff will then recommend a, a budget to work on the 100 million unfunded projects at the EJ that Neil Retzer just went over. And then we will then return to the board in the future workshops to give more information and a program investment strategy and request the authorization of the new fees. So that's still to come. So uh, next slide, please. I think that kind of wraps up our initial workshop for the tunnel asset class projects and need and you know Neil's on board here me and Patrick Colinda if you guys have questions. Oh that was a good presentation and um, um, you know I'm glad we're finally putting some money into that tunnel. It sees an awful lot of people, an awful lot of traffic every day. And so I'm really glad we're putting some money into that tunnel. Uh, do we have uh, uh, 
Commissioner Vasquez, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I think this is for Neil. Um, I have a couple questions on the tunnel and the priority list. One is uh, if the Clear Creek diversion and the berm is leaking and that's the reason for all the water damage, I'm wondering why that isn't on the do it first before you do the grouting and the wall repair and the other uh, remedies to the damage that's already been uh, experienced. Uh, that is a really good question. Um, so we, we have the same problem on the other side, on the west side where there is not a creek being diverted in almost the exact same spot. And not to dwell on it too much, but you, you're going to have water infiltration where the, the mountain meets the building anyway. This is just worse, made worse by that um, berm. And we're, we're also not 100% sure um, how extensive that leaking is. Um, it's really tough to get inside of that uh, culvert. Uh, it's extremely dangerous to get in there. Basically, we've just kind of looked down there with some scopes on some ropes, not to not to rhyme, but um, and, and kind of check things out. But we we heavily suspect that that's why the leaking is worse on the east than the west. But you would have that leaking in, anyway, just because of the nature of how the building and the mountain interface. Okay, thank, thanks for that explanation. But it seems to me again, uh, not to flog this any further, that if if you believe it's a source of the leaking, even if there's um, a structural problem associated with the intersection with the mountain, that you would put that up uh, earlier in your schedule. Yeah. The, the, the other question I have has to do with the wastewater treatment. I'm wondering, uh, with the current status, is it an environmental concern? Uh, no, we're, we actually do really well with our, our discharge permit with Department of Health. Um, it just is a time and maintenance issue, if that makes sense. Sure, it does. We, uh, we have better technology. We could spend a lot less time trying to keep up with it. Thanks, Neil. Yep. Commissioner Garcia, I think, has a question. I thought, I thought Adams was next. I'm sorry, I have Garcia. All right. Let's ask. Gar I'll go okay. after Garcia. Okay, that'll be fine. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Eula. Uh, just a quick question for Jared. Jared, on the on that chart, you mentioned that uh, about 40% of those funds are already allocated. Is there a list of projects that that funding is allocated for being the newbie commissioner? I'm just wondering what other bridge and tunnel project funding is out there? Yeah, we could definitely get that to you. You know, Patrick, you can uh, jump in if you like, if you know specifics. Yeah, so I, I think we can we can certainly put that list together. Jennifer, would you mind going to the slide quickly? Just that, I think it helped to make one one clarification. I believe it's the next forward twenty two. Yeah, so I think the forty percent is baked in to the number you see on the bottom line. So the hundred and twenty is what's left after that that forty percent that's essentially already allocated to the commitments you see above. Um, so in terms of project budget, we simplified this a bit. So this would include um, any prior project commitments and then um, any future project commitments as well. But um, to Jared's point, we can provide a list and, and break that out in more detail for you. Okay, great. Just kind of curious what, what other projects are out there that this funding is allocated for. Thank you. Commissioner Adams, do you have a question? <clears throat> Yes, thank you for the uh, for the excellent update. This is uh, very informative to me. Uh, I have a question, and I don't mean for this to sound morbid, but uh, in the course of all of this, can you tell me what kind of incidents have we had in the tunnel <clears throat> that would say could help me to evaluate what I consider to be already urgent? But but can you talk about what we've had happen? What experiences? Uh, both for workers and for travelers coming through there. Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I would say, luckily to this point, certainly nothing unsafe. So we actually do have a really good um, 
well-developed uh, biannual inspection program to hopefully catch a lot of that. Um, particularly like say, for example, those ceiling tiles that I, I talked about towards the end. Um, you know, we, we caught like a dozen of those before they came completely loose to fall on onto the, the traveling public. We caught them when they were just kind of loose. So we do have a good program to catch a lot of those safety issues. But going back to like the picture I showed of, um, it looked like a swimming pool in the middle of the road. Um, you know, that, that's an example that luckily that kind of happened during uh, uh, COVID outbreak in May when, when that was all going on that spring. So we're very lucky that traffic was extremely low that time of year. Otherwise we would have had traffic jams for weeks. I think we had that hole open for about three weeks. And then another uh, example is in the North tunnel, we had a water main break. Uh, that broke on Monday, thankfully, and then we got it closed back up and abandoned on Friday. But by Friday afternoon, uh, we had a backup down to Silver Plume um, just because we had the, the road down to one lane. So I think we've dodged some bullets here, but um, I'm tired of tired of dodging bullets. <laughs> it's no, I, I, think, I, I think we all are. And uh, that's the concern I've got is is we may not be lucky next week, next month, uh, you know, it may be that we may find ourselves really pressed to try and deal with this. So I appreciate the update and the info information about it. I just, I'm concerned that we're hearing this. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear the plan for how we act faster and what could we do. So I'm fully supportive of doing work in the tunnel. So thank you for this, uh, for this update and bringing it to us in this workshop. So it's appreciated. Uh, Mr. Stanton, I think you have a question. Thank you. Um, really appreciate Jared putting together that table on the budget, which really lays it out for 10 years. A nice effort. And Neil, thank you very much for such a conscientious effort to put the things in order, priority, what's needed, the idea of having backup generators on east side, east and west side of the tunnel, et cetera, really is excellent example of public policy. Thank you. Are there any other questions out there at this time for this? <clears throat> yeah, Gary Beatty. Yeah, um, is there any chance to apply for any grants or anything with the new infrastructure bill on um, the federal funding side that we could maybe try to accelerate some of these other projects through a grant process or some of the other infrastructure funds? I'll take a crack at that. Um, potentially, yes, there is a resiliency grant program that I think this would fit nicely into. I don't know if that would accelerate anything because we don't know the timing of the grants. We don't know what year we would get the grants and things, but it is something we're exploring probably in the resilience e, uh, federal, federal grant program. Well, I'm just really appreciative of the uh of this up this briefing on it and the, the work that's um that you've all brought to our attention that really needs to be done on the tunnels so jeff did you have something you wanted to say uh commissioner holgan has a comment oh, okay thank you commissioner staten so i guess uh, my question is more along the lines of commissioner adams are we budgeting enough in maintenance and operations to make sure that we're not always acting in crisis mode could we look at the how the budget is being developed with projects because we're only looking at one structure right now and i worry how many more we have like this and so to the extent that we can plan for for maintenance so that it doesn't become relying on luck or relying on whatever it is that i think the more that we can plan um i would love to see that yeah that, that's a that's an excellent point that both of you have made and like just to give a little background i mean Pre-Senate Bill 260, our tunnel asset money was around $10 million a year. And so the main focus of this new Senate Bill 260 money is to address you know, the tunnels, which we have 11 eligible tunnels, but the big one, the major one is the EJ, 
You know, so I think it just kind of reiterates the timing and need and function of the of the legislation with Senate Bill 260 to address these things that, you know, we have been lucky, but that's part of the, the 260 plan to start addressing. Good answer. Jeff, did I see you want to say something? Actually, I was I was going to chime in on the same points that Herman made and then Jared made. So I'm yeah. good. <laughs> Thank you. Those are all good comments. Um, anything else anybody has wants to bring up about this? Oh, well, like, like I said, I'm really relieved to see all this concentration on the Eisenhower Johnson tunnels because uh, they have been a little bit neglected and we didn't have the funds to do it. So it's good to know that we have the 260 money and possibly some some uh, federal money to address because it is a it's definitely a resilience resiliency factor. So that's really important. Any final question before we move on to Floyd Hill? If not, thank you very much, Jared, and, and that was that was a good presentation. Thank you, um, Floyd Hill Project Scope Discussion with Steve Harrelson and Keith Stefanik. Are you there? Yeah, Steve's Steve. here. I think Keith's going to take the lead on the. On the okay. presentation, so hopefully we can get the presentation loaded up. Okay, this is a this is another good one we've talked about a lot, and I'm anxious to see us move forward on this one. All right, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Keith Stefanik, CDOT Deputy Chief Engineer. So as Steve said, uh, both him and I will be uh, tag team in this presentation, uh, walking through, walking the commission through an overall project status of Floyd Hill and also a scope update uh, regarding the project. So next slide. So the agenda for today's workshop, uh, first we'll go over a timeline of the project updates that have been provided to TC in the past. Uh, we'll do a quick review of Floyd Hill environmental status, move into uh, Senate Bill 260, alternative delivery transparency commitments that CDOT has. We'll go through a checklist of those, those transparency and accountability items. Uh, then we'll move on to, we'll discuss the, the overall project phasing, the, so the phasing of Floyd Hill and the delivery methods to uh, deliver that project. We'll go through uh, a quick over, overall status of the project. We'll discuss some of the RFP language that is out currently, uh, and then we'll finish up with a funding discussion. Okay. So a timeline of the project updates to TC. Uh, starting back in November of 2020, uh, we really came to TC and provided a, a general update to um, from HPT in Region 1 on just what the project is, where it's headed, uh, while it was in its environmental assessment phase. Uh, we came back in March of 2021 with an update on kind of a phasing and funding strategy. strategy. Then in June of 16, we developed that phasing and funding strategy a little bit more and we came to Transportation Commission with a recommendation uh, for an alternative delivery method, which was CMGC to del deliver the main, the main portion of the project. In November and in de December of 2021, there was uh, a chief engineer update from uh, Chief Harrelson, and then also a memorandum in your packets on uh, the overall status of the RFP and where we were at with, uh, with uh, some of the early action projects. And then today uh, we're here to really give a, a better uh, status update, a holistic status update, and really talk about some funding issues. So moving on to the Floyd Hill environmental status, uh, just as a reminder, there were two alternatives uh, evaluated in the, in the environmental assessment. The first one was a canyon viaduct alternative, which was the preferred alternative. And then the second was a tunnel alternative. The EA was signed in July of 2021 and released to the public for review. That comment period closed in October of 2021, and we received some minor um, un unsubstantive comments related to the environmental assessment. So right now, the environmental assessment's kind of just sitting there in, in hold. We're, we're waiting to move forward with the decision document. Um, we're, we anticipate a FONSI, a finding of no sig significant impact to be uh, issued in, we say 2022, because it needs to line up with uh, the overall uh, status of the project when we get the designer and the construction manager on board. And the reason for that kind of holding pattern is we want to make sure, we want to get our team on board, and we want to make sure there's no innovations um, that can be further pursued 
that might uh, save the, the, the project time and money. So we're just gonna hold a little bit on that decision document, get our team on board, start the design, and then move forward with that decision document. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the Senate Bill 260 alternative delivery commitments. So just a reminder, uh, 260 included uh, numerous transparency and accountability commitments uh, for the Department of Transportation as we pursue alternative delivery projects. Um, a lot of those commitments were, were, were hinged, in, in, hinged off a letter that um, both Director Liu and Chief Harrelson signed in March of 2021 that made a commitment uh, to CDOT's accountability and transparency on alternative delivery um, pre-Senate uh, Bill 260. So the Floyd Hill team has been working on completing those items that were incorporated in the 260 ever since we started the procurement process of this project. And the next slide will, will just give a, a, a broad detail of the seven major accountability and transparency items that are, that are within Senate Bill 260. As you can see, we've, we've uh, completed the first five um, it's been a very good process. It's a, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a, a brand new process for CDOT. It's a, just a more established and more um, open to the general public process. There's a lot more meetings. There's a lot more information provided the Transportation Commission uh, just to show uh, the transparency through, uh, through those measures. So the first five are done. Um, right now we're moving into the, where I would say number six. So once a once a selection is made on the uh, construction manager, we will then move into releasing the evaluation scores for each step of the solic solicitation phase. That really completes the procurement type of accountability and transparency and moves into the project delivery section of the accountability. So more to come in the future. Moving on to the project phasing and delivery methods. So um, we took a look at the project. It's, a, it's a approximately a $700 million project uh, estimated in the, in, the, in the environmental assessment. We wanted to make sure we could get out and do some early projects uh, while we really figure out exactly what we're going to do with both eastbound and westbound I-70 at Floyd Hill. So luckily in the, in the environmental assessment, there was some uh, early mitigation uh, or mitigation efforts uh, part of the project that were kind of outside of the project, the main project limits and those, those projects could be moved kind of, um, those could be moved along separately while we uh, focused on the main project. And those three projects are one, a wildlife crossing at Empire, two, a wildlife crossing at Genesee, and then third, Floyd, Floyd Hill roundabouts and microtransit infrastructure. So all three of those projects have been, uh, a designer has been brought on board, a designer engineer. Uh, they're moving forward with the design. Uh, we will be delivering those three projects via design bid build, and we hope to start construction in, in this year, 2022. Moving on to the larger project, what I refer to as the, pro the Floyd Hill project. Back up one slide, please. Um, Jennifer, thanks. <clears throat> the main project, Floyd Hill, will be delivered as a CMGC. Uh, in the later slides, we'll talk about we, we came uh, to the Transportation Commission in June and got approval for that use of uh, alternative delivery method. We just want to recap a little bit on what was presented, why it was presented, and where we're headed now. Um, back in June, we, we basically came to you and we said we wanted to do the westbound improvements because that was what was funded at the time. As we started moving into procurement, it made a lot of sense to start looking at the larger project um, and see what we can accomplish in a single project rather than uh, focusing on westbound only or eastbound only. So we'll cover that in a couple slides. Next slide. So the overall project status, we've been, the project team has been uh, very busy over the past year, uh, meeting with industry, getting requests for proposals out, advancing the project. So. This provides a, a really good uh, status of the early action, which I went over and we're hope, hoping to get into construction this year. But when you take a look at the main project, uh, the main pro Floyd Hill, Floyd Hill I-70 mainline project, uh, the preliminary design is complete. It's around a 20% level. Uh, went over the transparency and accountability steps that were completed. In June of, of 2021, CMGC was approved as the main delivery method for Floyd Hill by the Transportation Commission. 
a construction manager RFP uh, was released and shortlisted. Uh, we, we just conducted interviews last week uh, on final interviews on that on that selection. We have not made that selection yet at this time. Uh, the design RFP was was released and shortlisted. We have interviews on Friday for that for those shortlisted teams. Um, we anticipate making a final selection for both the construction manager and the designer by the end of this month, January. Um, a big a big portion of what we need to focus on moving forward is a funding plan for Floyd, Floyd Hill. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chief uh, Chief Harrelson to kind of walk through what we incorporate what we put in the RFP and then also the funding plan. You on mute, Steve? Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, last summer, when we um, were moving forward with the CMGC. Um, the funding plan was not completely in place. So we, uh, you know, had, we knew that the um, federal infrastructure bill was working its way through Congress and it was not complete, nor were we certain that it would become complete. So we wrote a, the RFP saying that the, the project would design both eastbound and westbound but at the, the moment that the RFP was being written, only, we'd only identified funding for um, the westbound side. And that at, at that point, though we were trying to design the, the full solution, um, we'd only had funding for, for what we identified as a westbound phase. But we included some language in the RFP, um, kind of hedging our bets, recognizing that uh, the federal infrastructure bill was was working its way through Congress. And now that it has passed Congress and, and we've got an idea of what's in it, um, we feel comfortable that by next September, we will have a, uh, a, good, a good opportunity to, um, to fill out this funding plan for both the eastbound and westbound. So uh, we just wanted to come to commission this month and, and kind of clarify that. But we, we wrote the RFP that that allowed both directions, but did not necessarily uh, mandate both directions. It just uh, allowed that that uh, one direction would would be built and two directions could be built. Now, with the passing of the the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, um, we recognize that it, that it's likely we can find the funding funding deficit. So, um, next slide, please. So the, what you see there on the, the top uh, little spreadsheet is the, the funding that we've identified for the project right now, which is $460 million, um, where the, the lower spreadsheet is uh, the project costs for doing the total project. So that would be both eastbound and westbound. And you can see that that total is 700, uh, which is a, a funding gap of 240 million. So um, it, one of the benefits of CMGC is as you go through the design, you build a cost model um, that describes you know, what, what you expect each feature to, co to, to cost in construction. And um, as, as we move through design, as we get a, uh, the final design consultant and the uh, CM contractor on board, um, we're going to uh, sharpen our pencils and and get see if we can lower that 700 number. At the same time, we're going to pursue funding through the federal um, federal channels that are in, outlined in the bipartisan infrastructure law, and and come up with and, and close you know hopefully shrink that 240 that we need, um, and also find whatever we do need that find that delta. So we're the. The RFP remains that we will uh, identify the final scope by September 1st, but we just wanted to report to commission that uh, we are, we're going full throttle towards completing the full scope. Thank you, Steve. That's about and, it. And before we turn it over to questions, comments, uh, just a, a few things to add. Can you back up that one slide, Jennifer? Uh, on the funding sources, I. I the Senate Bill 267 is actually 139 million. There was some discrepancies on there, so uh, just just a, a little bit of information there. And then on the HPTE, uh, right now a preliminary uh, toll and revenue study was 65 million. That's currently being updated. We're hoping to close that gap a little bit more. We're hoping that comes in around 80, 85 million 
on some preliminary numbers. So um, there's some other ways of closing the gap uh, via the HPTE TNR study and what uh, they might be able to finance on that end. So um, with, with the measures that Steve mentioned and also HPT, I think that gap uh, can close a little bit more. But, but really to, to end the presentation, um, you know, we, we brought a resolution in front of Transportation Commission on, in June of 2021. It was approved for CMGC as the, as the main delivery method for Floyd Hill. But during those discussions, we, we talked a lot about westbound um, and we talked about future funding for eastbound. So what we wanted to do in full transparency is bring a new resolution in front of the Transportation Commission that specifically um, reduced any ambiguity, um, made sure that everyone understood that CMGC would be the delivery method for the entire project and that we would try to figure out the funding gap um, as we advance the project. So that will be, um, we will ask for your approval of that resolution tomorrow. And, and one other point to add um, regarding, you know, if, if we just built the westbound phase now and then added the eastbound phase at, at some point uh, in the future, based on our preliminary cost estimates, we think that that would cost an additional $100 million in present value, just because building it all at once provides us some, some phasing opportunities that don't exist if, if we defer it, you know, for, for another five or 10 years. So, um, you know, I, I think spending 240 to save, spending 240 now rather than 340 um, five or 10 years from now, we, we think is a, a good decision. Well, I, I do too. I, <clears throat> I, you know, when I saw it on the agenda again, I, I, it, it, we did approve it. And um, now it's just with some variation of the possibility of doing both eastbound and westbound is, is an exciting opportunity because we, as we know, if you can do the project all at once, it's gonna end up saving money in the long run. Are there some questions out there with commissioners on what this is about. This is, a, this is another resolution just to clarify that we are gonna go for the CMGC uh, uh, type of construction. And it uh, looks like Commissioner Stanton has a question, but this is for the commission's sake. This is to clarify that we, we've already approved the, the type of contract and now we're gonna approve uh, the possibility of additional funding so we can do both sides. So uh, Commissioner Stanton. Thank you, uh, Stephen Keith. Appreciated the idea of phasing opportunities and trying to save money now over the long term. Question with inflation approaching 10% and costs for building materials, concrete, et cetera, going up. Um, have you factored this in long term for the whole project? In other words, what's the cost escalation potential? So, you know, our, our uh, EMA group, the engineering. Uh, estimates and market analysis is keeping track of inflation. We're seeing, you know, currently some some bid acceleration. Um, it's, I think, uh, not as extreme as in other parts of the economy, but that's something we have to keep our eye on. And again, that's another argument to uh, to go ahead and bite the bullet and and do both phases now. Um, if if we are facing uh, seven to ten percent inflation moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hickey, I think I see you have a question. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to ask the Chief or anyone not to ask you to reveal anything that's not public, but is there a time where the you have to make the decision about just doing eastbound, or just doing westbound or not? Um, the, the RFP for the contract says September 1st. We'll make that decision by September 1st. All right. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Um, any further questions for uh, Steve or Keith? Well, I think this is really, I think this is exciting to have the opportunity to possibly get the, the project done um, all at once instead of a delayed project. So hopefully this will move forward and we'll have that opportunity and the inflation I'm sure will certainly uh, enter into it. But if there's no further questions. Uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Garcia. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it come up. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you. Um, okay. Just a quick question. So in the event the funding gap is not closed, uh, yeah, I guess we won't do westbound. Is that the, the thought process? No, um, the other way around, we won't do eastbound. eastbound. Right, right now, oh, east, eastbound okay. is three lanes, but it's substandard geometry and westbound is two lanes. So we will, 
regardless, we'll do westbound and get three lanes in each direction. And the the goal would be to, to do eastbound, which would improve the, the three lane geometry. Some of the curves there are, you know, 38 mile an hour design speed, which is uh, not adequate for an interstate. Let's say you get part of the funding figured out, the funding gap figured out. Is there an opportunity to do part of the eastbound? You know, not? that's that's the beauty of the CMGC. We we get everybody into a room and we knock heads until we come up with a, the best solution. Okay, thank you. Okay, this will be a resolution in front of you tomorrow uh, for a decision. Any further questions before we move on? Seeing none, thank you very much for that. And we'll see you tomorrow for the resolution. Okay, let's move into the 10-year plan update and fiscal constraints with Rebecca White. Rebecca, are you on board? I am here. Good afternoon, there Commission. Are. There you are. Yeah. Happy New Year. Um, so uh, I will kick this off and, and kind of give you an intro of what you'll hear today as Jennifer pulls up the slides. Uh, think of this presentation really as in three components. Marissa Gahan, who leads our planning team, will talk you just to set the table on where we are heading into this update, uh, what we've accomplished so far, just to remind commission of, of where we're at at this end of, of year 3B, heading into year four status. Then on the second part, Amber, Blake, and I will talk you through some of the policy issues and sort of equity discussions that we are having um, as we look at updating the plan. Um, really centering around uh, a wonderful set of resources that is certain, but it is very complicated. Um, we've got a lot of different streams of revenues coming from both the Senate Bill 260 and the Infrastructure Bill, uh, which makes it uh, just a little bit more complicated to figure out how we can allocate all this funding to the different projects in the plan. So we'll talk a bit through that. And then Aaron Willis will sort of close out the discussion uh, with where we are in the overall time frame of building the plan. Uh, and also we'll let the commission know how we're doing in meeting the new greenhouse gas standard, which is now very integral to this as well. So with that, let me start with Marissa and uh, we'll walk you through this. Hi, thanks Rebecca. So taking it just a little step back, just to refresh her on why we're updating the, the 10 year plan. Um, there's real, really three main reasons. The first being um, the good news, um, new revenue in October um, 2021. Um, I believe Jeff gave you a presentation about the revenue outlook and update approach for the 10-year plan. So he looked at the new funding provided by Senate Bill 260 and um, along with it was expected dollars, but now happily they're real dollars from um, the federal infrastructure bill. So we're getting more and more information about about the federal infrastructure and what that funding um, would mean for CDOT every day. Um, the greenhouse gas rule be, rulemaking is the second reason we're updating the 10-year plan. Um, just in December, you took action um, on, on that rulemaking and adopted um, the GHG pollution reduction planning rule. So now the 10-year plan must comply with the new standard um, for reduced greenhouse gas emissions. And the last reason is um, also a good reason. We've made um, significant progress in delivering the first four years of our 10-year plan. So now it's now that we're um, funding the last year of our original four-year list, it's time to determine our next set of projects and priorities. Next slide, please. Um, when we first built the 10-year plan, the original 10-year plan, we built it around your TC guiding principles. So I think a few months ago, um, we, we showed you some ideas and, and got your guidance on updating um, these um, principles. So just wanted to show you um, the final updated guiding principles um, that we worked on together. They've been updated now to include social equity, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and um, connecting, adding um, some updated guiding principles around the work done to develop the 2045 statewide and regional plans. Um, next slide. So to date, we funded the first um, three years of the 10-year plan. 
I'm going to start um, on the highway side. So um, looking at all the funding that we've received from Senate Bill 1, Senate Bill 267, and most recently Senate Bill 260, plus um, some federal stimulus dollars that came in during that time, we've been able to advance 85% um, of the projects from our, our original four-year four list. Um, so that's um, really exciting. And we um, have been tracking um, that spending with our um, equity targets. So as a reminder, we, we um, established um, regional equity based on the RPP midpoint formula, which is the midpoint between our current RPP formula um, that um, more favors our urban areas and what, what I'm gonna call our historic formula that we had in place for many years prior to that, that um, favors slightly the, the more rural areas. So um, we arrived at a balance between um, those two formulas and that was what was agreed upon um, to establish um, equity in terms of highway distributions. Next slide. So this table depicts um, where we are now, um, same, same thing, but on the transit side. Um, the transit equity targets were set um, using the um, original multimodal options, options fund formula to direct this, the transit funds. Next slide. So in summary, about 2.2 billion has been allocated to date for projects in one through three. Um, we are down to our fourth and final year of our original four-year um, plan and have about 380 million in remaining project commitments. Um, again, this represents about 85, or that we're about 85% finished with our original four-year plan. And also something important to note is that we've been able to advance critical projects from the out years of our plan um, to align with new revenue that's become available. Um, for example, when we received the federal stimulus funding and that we've also been able to get some projects ready from the out years of the plan so that we're ready to respond quickly once the next four year list is established and get those projects moving. Um, we also um, built the original 10 year plan um, um, using some rule paving and asset management targets. Um, so we, we said that 50% of our total investment should include elements of um, asset management, service treatment, and bridge, and that 25% of that um, should be focused on rural non-interstate pavement projects or a rural paving program. So we are on track to, to meeting these targets. Um, for our first year, four years of the 10-year plan. Um, some notable accomplishments here include um, 33 road paving projects have been advanced for funding to date, and 14 of those are now complete or under construction. Um, we've also had some notable areas of progress in terms of fixing our assets. Um, we just saw a presentation um, on uh, EJMT, but that some funding went to that. We've also looked at um, addressing poor interstate pavement along I-76, as well as improving safety and road conditions on, on um, Colorado 14, I'm sorry, 13. Next slide. So that is sort of a, a recap of where we are now. I'm gonna turn it over to Amber to talk about the next four years and some thoughts about um, where we wanna go next when we build the next four years of the plan. Thank you, Marissa. So we're going to start out with transit and we have two slides here on transit. We'll start out with our transit allocation target. So in the original four year list, as Marissa mentioned, we used a 10% allocation for transit. So it set a, set a baseline of 10% will go towards transit funding or funding transit projects. Um, after the past four years and really looking at the intent of truly creating a fully multimodal transportation system and achieving the vision that is late, that we have laid out for, for CDOT of a multimodal transportation system that meets the needs of all of our users. Um, we are looking at potentially uh, this recommendation of not doing a set aside for transit, rather looking at transit as a piece of the transportation system on the whole. And the advantages to this approach would be that it would more fully allow us to integrate transit into the 10-year plan projects. 
And it ensures that we're thinking of the transportation system with all modes at the same time, rather than in different segments or silos. Um, there is a disadvantage to this approach, which could potentially open us up to a less than 10% for transit. However, with the new greenhouse gas requirements, we expect that the total investment in transit would be above the 10% allocation that currently has the set aside for transit. And we're not restricting ourselves to 10%, which gives us the flexibility to be adaptable when it comes to meeting our greenhouse gas goals and planning for true multimodal projects. Next slide. The next piece is looking at the equity targets. And previously, the highway and the transit allocations were tracked using different equity targets. And in moving forward, what we are recommending as staff is that we fund year four projects with that 10% set aside and the, the two different equity targets. However, moving forward, we're recommending that transit and highway have the same equity target. So we split the baby, so to speak. Um, the advantages to this approach which makes it much easier for us to track. It improves transparency and our reporting abilities on delivering the 10-year plan. If there's no straight clean cut percentage divide between highway and transit. And as we plan the multimodal projects, we wanna include elements of highway transit, bike ped all together, together as multimodal projects, that it doesn't necessarily make sense to have two separate equity targets. The disadvantage to this approach would be that it doesn't allow for transit to be taken off the top and tracked separately. So if the priority was to track transit separately, then this could be an issue because we would have fully integrated projects with all the modes of transportation um, where we may not be able to say this amount directly went specifically to just transit. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca to talk about rural paving and asset management. Thanks, Amber. And this may be a, a good moment um, just to note for the entirety of commission uh, that we took the same presentation to the stack on Friday. And I do know a number of commissioners were able to join and listen to that discussion. Uh, but I, I want to, to make sure the entire group knows that we did get some pretty lively and, and strong input on some of these, what I'm sort of seeing as policy decisions. Uh, and you'll get all those in minutes, but I, I think they're part of the reason we're bringing this forward to commission and wanting to get your input in stack is there are some different, different sides, different advantages and disadvantages to making changes. Um, and, and one of the things that stack noted is we should uh, have had included some disadvantages on this slide I'll show you now. So one of the issues we've been thinking about at a staff level is we've done this incredible work to invest in our rural pavement and have focused largely on um, non-interstates, our, our small low volume roads. Those are the ones that often get overlooked by the models that we've talked a lot about. Uh, on the other side of that, there are some stretches of rural interstate that function very much like a lower volume road, think of, of pieces of I-70 East and I-76. And so we'd sort of put out there if we should open up this category to actually include interstates when they were indeed in very rural parts of our state. There was a lot of concern from Stack um, in this approach. And I'd say the disadvantage um, that they noted that's not on the slide is that begins to get very difficult when you're thinking of the I-70 mountain corridor and the incredible needs you have there as that corridor passes through kind of a patchwork of what are considered, considered rural counties and those that exceed the sort of population threshold. So that, I think that was good perspective. Um, I would say, you know, at a staff level, we're, we're sort of um, now thinking to stay the course on, on this approach and keep the focus on, on non-interstates. Um, certainly I can tell you, as we look at the plan and talk to the RTDs, we're full steam ahead to deliver those rural paving projects in the plan. So this was not really an idea to fundamentally change how we would um, pick projects, but more how we sort of talk about success and track um, our progress for, towards that 25%. So it was a good perspective from the stack. 
they also um, had a lot of concerns with not having a set aside for transit um, and then had some feedback also on how we look at those various equity formulas. And one last piece I'll leave you on stack uh, just for the entire commission to know is that there was some discussion around reopening the split the baby formula, which we have we've been calling it to date where we took this sort of RPP midpoint and I expect them to want to vote next month and bring you all their input on that issue in particular. Claire Hall, I, I see a hand up from Commissioner Stewart. Do you want me to? Uh, Commissioner, I think Commissioner Holquind was first. Commissioner Holquind, did you have a question? A question. Are you? Okay, I did Commissioner Holquin have a question or a, I can't hear you? I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, Commissioner Stewart and then um, Commissioner Brackey. Thank you. Um, you know, many of us sat in on that uh, stack meeting last week and um, listened to the discussion that the stack brought up. And, uh, you know, we're embarking on this update to the 10 year plan. And I, and I understand the stack would like to revisit the distribution formula um, that we both, both Stack and TC agreed to in 2019. So for new commissioners, I just wanted to weigh in if that's all right. Uh, the formula, and I think Rebecca and Melissa, Marissa both spoke to this, was really a compromise in um, splitting the baby, um, taking the regional priority program formula um, that didn't favor one or the other, but, but sort of went through the middle. And I appreciate that no single formula uh, should be set in stone, but I also think we need to be careful about the frequency that we consider um, changes to those uh, to those formulas and the impact of those decisions, um, particularly as we're halfway through this 10-year um, effort on the 10-year plan. And to that end, I just don't think it's the right time to um, make changes to that formula. Uh, we have sort of a, a process, a cadence of, of making decisions, which really aligns with the four-year planning cycle and program distribution. And um, it's, it's worked for the four year, first four-year planning and anticipated for the next a number of years planning. Um, you know, it's one of these issues we could probably uh, talk around for months and land in the same place we are today. Uh, the last discussion we had about this took us, I don't know how many sessions, almost close to a year to come up with a formula that we could agree on. So there's really too many issues to discuss to, to open this up again in my mind, um, to take issues with this in, in the process of the cycle that we're in now. Thanks. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Hickey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate Commissioner Stewart's comments because that's good perspective that I don't have just finishing my first year on the commission. Um, but I noted, for example, up above, we weren't fulfilled to 100% all of the equity distribution on transit, I think it was. I lost my second screen, so I don't have this slide number. But, and I would want that to be balanced before we get eliminated the transit portion, because otherwise I feel like those that are behind in their relative equity allocation would you know, be left at a deficit and then not ever kind of get to fulfill that. And I realize we're thinking differently if we pass through that veil, but that would be a concern that we wouldn't want to start from a deficit position into a new allocation program. But I, I share Commissioner Stewart's concerns about this because I'm worried about unintended consequences. And I would just want to be able to put some more thought into it. Commissioner Brackey. Great, um, thank you. So just kind of um, adding on and I appreciate um, the comments from the other commissioners. Um, and I, I was um, able to sit in and listen at the staff meeting. I think that was helpful. I think as we're doing this, it would be helpful and because I feel like in some ways we might be in the midst of uh, Rebecca's and staff's presentation. And so I'm not sure if we're jumping in at the right 
playing on all this, but <laughs> we're apparently in it. So <laughs> I'll offer my my two cents. Um, I, I do think it is really important for us to hear the conversations from Stack, and I appreciate Rebecca sharing the feedback that came from the other day because there was quite a, a substantial amount of discussion about all of this. And um, again, from listening to that, from reading the materials and hearing the presentation so far, uh, you know, where I'm at is I agree with Commissioner Stewart that we it's not the right time to try to reopen or re negotiate a formula. Um, from my experience, that could take months and not years to try to do that. And we could end up, as, as was said, right back where we already are with this sort of negotiated um, middle point. I have trouble with the split the baby phrase. So <laughs> I don't know if there's another way we can <laughs> refer to that. That seems to have taken on a life of its own. It gets used all the time. Um, so I, I, I agree uh, on that front to try and hold the uh, formula allocations, how we've been doing them. Um, however, I really took to heart the comments that stack about the percent for transit. And I just want to clarify again, because I recognize we have new members on TC, there was never the ceiling for transit. It was not a fixed 10%. It was a minimum 10% for transit. And so I, I think that it's important to, to keep that minimum in play, even as a cross check. I completely you know, uh, support the idea of looking at our transportation system holistically. I'm obviously a, a proponent for transit and multimodal and walking and biking and all of the, the different um, modes that we need. Um, and we should be developing our projects that are holistic, but I think it's also important to do that cross check and make sure that at, at least at a minimum, if not more, it, then 10% is going towards transit because I think we need to know that for ourselves. And I think uh, many of our stakeholders are gonna be interested in that information. So I, um, I, I'd i like to keep that um, in, the, in the process just to make sure that we're having that, that cross check that's there. I'm neutral and supportive of the staff's recommendations around the rural paving piece um, on that. So basically stay the course with our formula distribution, keep the 10% for transit, and then go with the staff recommendation on rural paving is uh, where, where I am. So thank you. Okay. Commissioner Bracky, do you, or B, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, I guess I'll start with the, <clears throat> the split between um, the rural and uh, interstate. I'm glad to hear not looking to add the interstate back into the rural because our interstates could take all the rural funding <laughs> because of the needs on, on the corridors. Um, I do kind of want to push back a little bit that, you know, our rural interstates serve as a low volume road. Well, they may be lower volume, but they carry the stuff that's needed <laughs> for all the front range to get there. Um, as I see the truck traffic out here, out east, yeah, we're only, you know, 15,000 vehicles a day or so, but those, a lot of those are carrying most of the goods and services that are needed in the front range. So I agree interstates are a lower volume, but the reason they're called interstate is because they're so critical to the overall economy of the state and the country. So. Um, just wanted to voice my concern about trying to put interstates back into trying to be funded out of a rural pavement that's been neglected for years and we need the money going there, especially since we are not moving in the budget more money into the maintenance line to offset the uh, deterioration of the materials we've needed to just maintain the rural uh, highways, um, the chip seals, the minor overlays and those things. So. If we were adding 100 million to our maintenance budget to get more materials out onto rural roads or 150 million a year, I'd maybe be a little bit more inclined to say, okay, we can use that to address interstate some. But without additional funding for maintenance and the preventative maintenance, I am not against or in favor of adding the interstates back into the rural piece. Um, on the perspective of including transit and all the highway projects all together without any delineation 
into the equity formula. I am having trouble knowing how that equity piece can play out um, because a lot of rural areas don't need a lot of the transit dollars or those multimodal funds. Yeah, they can use some, but the impact to meet the goals of the greenhouse gas rules and, and those of trying to get more people off the roads, the rural areas don't have a lot of ability to reduce the travel time or travel volumes by vehicle by those other modes. We can do a little bit, but to get the real bang for the buck, you need to be doing those in the metropolitan areas. So I could see that actually shifting a little bit more money to highway maintenance for rural areas, um, while the metro areas, if it's all lumped together into one big pot for the equity formula. So um, just having trouble understanding how that would play out when you put all that together. If rural areas are gonna be encouraged to try to do a lot more transit than really is needed, um, especially in eastern Colorado, um, or or not. And then opening the formula, I think we do need to hold off on opening it again. I think on a four-year cycle is good. Um, I didn't agree with adoption of the last formula, but I acknowledge it's done. And I think we need to get some stability in our planning and not constantly keep changing things, even the 75-25 if every time we come up with new funding or anything and we start changing things again to, we need to try to get more stability, um, three, four year cycles at least. Um, so we can, our partners can plan, we can plan, and there's just some stability and not constantly creating conflict between groups on jockeying for trying to get their projects or their things moving forward. So a lot of perspective there. Um, <laughs> Any feedback would be appreciated. Okay, thank you. And we'll let Vasquez um, have a comment. And, and then Rebecca, I think we interrupted you right in the middle of your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I apologize for that. Uh, Commissioner Vasquez? Yes, thank you, Chair Hall. I'll keep my comments short given our interruption of your presentation, Rebecca. Uh, but one, focusing in on the uh, elimination of the 10% minimum carve out for transit, I'm wondering in the nature of unintended consequences, whether it would make it difficult for Colorado to go look for grants and federal funding if they can't state explicitly uh, what's going for transit. And it, that's uh, an ignorant question, um, asking whether that could be uh, one of the deficits to making that change. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'd like to see that um, carve out explicitly made uh, in order to add impetus for multimodal, uh, but with the planning idea that you'd look at an integrated uh, plan, even though you have this uh, carve out. So kind of a middle of the road, don't change the carve out, but uh, do your uh, very integrated yeah. planning for highways and transit, just as you've been more recently reporting it to us uh, and showing it in your okay. plan. Yeah. Rebecca, I'm sorry, we did interfere right in the middle of your, so if you want to go ahead with your presentation, you probably no, some of these is, questions as you go. Yeah, thank you, Chair. This actually has been a really helpful interlude, and that's part of the reason I was saying this presentation sort of has these three pieces, and, and this was the discussion I, I really wanted to have. Um, just a, a couple of remarks based on what um, we've just heard. For Commissioner Hickey on, on looking back and making sure we reach full equity, for transit as well as for highway. I just wanna say that's absolutely the intent. Uh, we, we have made a strong commitment to our stakeholders that before we sort of close out the this year four, we will have made everyone whole in terms of those equity targets. So I'll show you a slide here in the minute, but we that is a, um, a distinct focus of the team on both sides of the house. Um, and Commissioner Brackey, I agree with you. We need a rebranding re on Split the Baby. Um, it's driving me crazy too. So maybe we'll start calling it Solomon or something. This poor baby. Um, but I really appreciate the perspectives there. And Commissioner Beatty, I, I, as, as I was saying, low volume interstates, I was wanting to draw those words back. <laughs> so thank you for picking up on that. Yeah. I think the point we were struggling with is 
are we are we not doing our our interstates um, the the investment and the focus they should have by sort of treating them separately? But I, this has been really helpful conversation. Um, and then as well on the the ten percent for transit, I don't know if Director Liu you wanted to chime in here, but this has been a really good conversation. I think is sort of changing some of our perspectives on that. Rebecca, I think you should complete the vote. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I think just based on what we've heard today and from Stack, we'll go ahead and and continue with a 10% uh, or a minimum floor for transit. But like Commissioner Vasquez said, it's an integrated system we're building. We need to think about it and talk about it that way. And we can do both at once. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, I think those were anything else you would add, Shoshana, on any of that? No, I think that sums it up perfectly. And, you know, so it's helpful for us to know that there's such strong feelings on the 10% floor, and that's not something we're going to um, fall on our swords over if others prefer it the other way. So thanks for the feedback. Okay, well, now I'll move us into the hard part, um, which is actually looking more uh, towards the, the funding flow. So if you could go, I think it's advancing. Yeah, just one more slide. So Jeff brought you sort of this construct back in October where we're really looking at the update to the plan and these four chunks. And as I've been thinking and working on this, I think it's more collapsing into three, but first and foremost is to close out year four. And that's what I'll talk a little bit more about today. Next is to pick a new year four and talk about a branding problem. I think I'm gonna have to think of a way to talk about um, the next four years without confusing people. But um, we've, we've discussed a lot that that's just a really good, helpful time frame to have. The regions really rely on that. And it, it is that immediate future that we can um, plan for and deliver. So we need to create that next list. Uh, the next two sets, why I'm beginning to think of these together is that then becomes our out years. And so it's both that fiscal year 27 through 30 but then in building a 10 year plan, and now that we're fully into 2022, we wanna stretch out to 2032 so that when commission adopts this update, we have a, a 10 year lookout. And similar to before, I think we would treat those out year projects uh, to be a little bit more of um, not picking an as precise year that a, a project would land in, not saying this is a fiscal year 28 project, but to have that collection of projects there and ready to move in always and as we build a new four years. So today we'll spend a little bit of time just on this closing out year four. Um, there's a lot on this slide and, and the numbers get sort of complicated. Um, so I'll do my best here. But basically what the team did is we took every project in the 10 year plan that has a year four commitment and added up all those dollar amounts. And that came to $380 million in uh, including transit and remaining commitments. The, the complication with that number is that assumed a full 170 million for the I-270 project. That is our, our one of our mega projects that has been a commitment in the 10 year plan. It had a uh, a number identified for the first four years, and it's a big number. However, that 170 doesn't actually reflect what um, CDOT is in a position to spend in this next year. Uh, the project is still going through NEPA. We're still doing some look uh, at how we can approach that project. So to assign a full 170 million uh, to basically just sit there um, would be probably not a good decision in terms of getting these funds out, but furthermore, it really impacts equity because you um, you put that entire 170 million in region one and the, the whole equity um, tends to collapse a bit. So what we did then is use that 380 million, but then divided among the regions to reach their full equity formula. And so everyone is made whole by the amount of, of funds that you see here. And you'll note we are tracking transit separately because we wanna reach those targets and we don't fully have the transit picture scoped out. So that's part of the reason region five doesn't have any money yet for transit is we just have to figure out what the transit ish need is there. So that's 380 million to finish year four. 
that is not, um, we have, we will have more money than that because the fourth issuance of the certificates of participation will hopefully reach closer to 630 million. That would allow us to carry 250 million into the next four year plan. Um, so perhaps chair, I can pause there because this is a complicated slide and see if I lost anyone. Anyone have any questions? I'm drawing a blank screen here for some reason all of a sudden. Is there, is there, are there some questions out there? I've got a, I don't know what's wrong with my screen all of a sudden. Uh, uh, Commissioner Stewart. Garcia, we've got a quick question on, on the transit funding in Region 5. Yeah, please go ahead because for some reason my screen went blank. So please, do you have a question, Mark? Yeah, I was just curious, uh, you identify, Rebecca, that you don't have any um, transit funding in Region 5 in this uh, slide. Are there any thoughts on projects or funding? Or what's the status there? I'm going to turn to my okay. friend over in transit. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, Commissioner Garcia. This is a great question. So right now, the Division of Transit and Rail, we have uh, five meetings set up, one with each of the regions to review the currently funded and proposed future funded projects in each of the regions with all of the transit agencies. And we're taking this opportunity to touch base with each of the agencies to make sure that projects that do exist are still moving forward and the priorities are in alignment with the local and regional priorities. And so for Region 5, this means that um, it's actually the meeting will take place on Friday of this week and we will be meeting with the agencies and they'll have an opportunity to let us know what additional projects are of high priority um, for the region and we'll use that information to move forward. So it's not a shortage of projects, it's just uh, we haven't identified or prioritized this project. Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Stanton, do you see some others? Because I still- No, have... it's uh, Commissioner Stewart, I'm sorry, Commissioner Brackey, and then myself. Okay, thank you. I still have a blank screen for some reason. Okay, I'll help I you. Back. I can hear you, but I can't see you. So if you'll handle that for a minute to make sure we get everybody's questions. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Stanton. I appreciate that. Uh, my, perhaps this is a just a conversation I'll have offline with you, uh, Rebecca and Shoshana, about the 170 million for 270. Um, I understand the reasoning for this, and then I can see that it will um, delay this project um, somewhat out of the four, next four years or into the next four years, into the next four years. Um, so maybe I'll just have a, a, a side conversation with you, but I did, I did want to mention that um, um, I understand that the money is was was um, intended for this four year project, uh, this first four years, but it, 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 because of the delay in some of the preliminary work, it's pushed out. Um, just wanted to be on record as saying um, I'm fully aware of this, but I'll have a side conversation with um, both of you later to learn a little bit more about what the um, anticipated next steps are and how soon we can get this project um, back on track. Thank you. Yeah, I can make it very clear that uh, what's shown here does not change at all the commitment to I-270. I think what we just need to figure out is the timing in which those funds flow. So that that is still absolutely the same as it, as it always was. We just got to figure out when they need it. Well, yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Stewart. Uh, Commissioner Bracke just lowered her hand. Uh, Commissioner Vasquez and then myself. Uh, thanks, Don. Um, I just have a, a dumb question. I haven't run the numbers. When you have zero for Region 5 in transit, you have $380 million to carve up. Does that, once you have transit project dollars on the right column, does the left column for Region 5 go down? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes. It's a subset. 
I'm going to chime in also. When you look back at the years one through three projects that are funded, if you go back to that equity, transit has already hit. We've already hit the transit equity target. We're, we're off by like 0.2%, I think it is. Um, and so really in looking at the projects that are currently funded, if we have projects that haven't moved forward at all, we want to evaluate whether or not those projects are still valid. If they're not still valid projects, we want to make sure that the money goes towards a tra transit project that is a priority that's going to move forward. Um, so I think it's a, a, there's a few layers on it, um, but to help round out the conversation, as you can see here, a little bit short on the equity, but very, well, we're actually over the equity. I was reading that backwards. Um, so that's those are the layers and the pieces that we're looking at for the year four projects. Thanks, Amber. Yeah. Thanks, Commissioner Vasquez. Um, Rebecca, my thought is that you've hit it exactly correct on how to move forward based on this. So I'm full for it. I would like to share something though. Um, a couple of years ago at the beginning of COVID at a Dr. Karg RTC meeting, and they were talking about our transit priorities. And I said, do you have a plan B? Because we know that a lot of the transit ridership has not come back. Uh, bus schedules have been cut in the Denver area, et cetera. And I really appreciate what Amber just said that we need to be able to uh, be flexible and validate because I'm afraid that we're plunging forward and of course, a lot of this has to do with greenhouse gas and we want to get as much bang for the buck out of transit bus, everything possible that we can get out of it. But if we build it, will they come? Will they ride the transit effectively and get out of their damn cars, as people would say? Whoops, I think you froze up. It, perhaps the internet is censoring him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think so. No. He said a naughty word. <laughs> Don, you got your got no frozen up. It's interesting. Our systems are having fun today. So, well, it was great comments. Don, we loved what you had to say. <laughs> Anybody else have a comment? Commissioner Brackey's hand is up. Okay. Sure. I said I still have this blank, blank screen. I can see all your faces and the rest and of you. Blank. There you go. Okay, Commissioner Bracky. Great, thanks. Sorry, I, I thought I had my question answered and then as the conversation went on, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. What we're talking about right now is specifically for year four. And what I took from that last slide was what the proposal is, is to finish out all the projects that are remaining in that year four column. I always keep this, the plan in front of me and the little sheets for our, our region. So that's my understanding. When I read this, I'm hearing you say, we're gonna finish out all the year four projects and that's what totals the 380 million and that amount includes the transit component. So, I, so I'm looking for confirmation that I'm understanding that point correctly. Yes. Okay, so we're not, there's nothing carrying over from the year four set of projects. That'll be all done. And then we'll just face years five through 10. I, I would just say the one complexity is I-270 because it, it is one that will, cro it will cross over. Okay, all right, so that, that's helpful for me. And then, um, so that's what I was looking for. And then just a following on um, Commissioner Stanton's point about transit, I, I do think you, you make a really good point. We have to be thinking about the, the current needs for people to travel by transit and the future needs. It isn't about restoring the type of transit necessarily that we had in the past, but what are the types of transit in all types? So we're gonna hear more about Pegasus later today and there's and Mustang and there's, there's so many different types of transit and so my hope is, is that as we go forward and these dollars are continue to be invested in transit, 
it's transit of the future, not transit of the past. And so it, we're going to have to look at that as CDOT and then all of our other um, agency partners as well. How do we use these dollars to grow the ridership on transit, but that transit might look differently in the future than it's looked traditionally. So there's my soapbox around transit. <laughs> so thank you. And could I just follow up? Uh, I hit my mute button and lost power basically. So uh, I really do think we need to be able as a department, you know, build, measure, learn, you go through a couple of years, revise and update because I, I get the sense at least that Dr. Cog, it's a theology about this amount of transit. And I fully take what Commissioner Bracke said. We're looking to build the transit for the future, but I want it to be continuously updated so that we have realistic and uh, the best possible use of the taxpayer's money. Thank you. All those are good points, Rebecca. Yeah. Have more that you want. Uh, I will, unless Amber wants to chime in there, I'll, I'll thank you for that input and I'll, I'll move us to the next slide. Okay. Okay, so the, the next piece then is um, building the next four years, as I mentioned, uh, and then uh, what projects we sort of refresh in the out years. And if you could actually just go to the next slide, uh, you know, this is, I just want to share with Commission uh, what staff is focusing on now as we bring you options for how to look at, at the amount of money we'll have available for the next four years. And it's, uh, there's just a lot of funding sources. Uh, it's an absolute wonderful place to be. We have both new uh, state legislation and federal, uh, but uh, most of those dollars are coming through in, in separate programs. So if you just look at Senate Bill 260 alone, we have the completion of the certificates of participation. As a reminder, we have to uh, expend those dollars or obligate them, I guess, in three years. We have an increase to the bridge and toll enterprise. And you heard about Eisenhower Johnson Tunnel today, and that's fantastic. Uh, we have the non-attainment enterprise. Those dollars can only be expended in the ozone non-attainment area in the front range. We have the extension of the multimodal mitigations and options fund that can only go towards multimodal projects. And then finally, you get to our most flexible source of, of funding, which is through the HUTF. Then on the federal side, we're still unpacking that bill. Uh, we got just Friday the bridge numbers. And so while Jeff has projections, we're getting uh, pieces of information from DC as we get more certainty around those dollars. In some cases, I think we'll nail it. In other cases, um, the bridge money we got actually came in a little bit differently. And then of course, uh, Congress put, uh, I don't know, Herman, well over a billion dollars into grant programs from that bill. And we think we can be really successful in applying for a number of grants for 10-year plan projects. So these are all the pieces we're thinking about as we um, figure out the funding flow for the next four years and the out years of the plan. And I think we'll have a, a much better picture for commission next month, but I just sort of wanted to preview some of what we're chewing on and, and struggling with a bit as we, uh, as we figure out this next piece. Chair, I see a hand up from Commissioner Beattie. Yeah, this is just a quick question on your bullet point for SB 260. You had bridge and toll enterprise. That should be tunnel enterprise, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, thank just, you. I don't know, we yeah, can't yeah. correct it for the public, but it just threw, caught my eye there. Thank you. Typo. Thank you. You're gonna be the new commissioner's Inc. <laughs> okay, uh, that that's, I'm gonna leave you there. Um, there's a lot to come, um, a lot here in this briefing, and I really appreciate the uh, the input on some of those issues we talked about. Um, happy to take any other questions, but it should be an interesting set of discussions next month as well. Any further, any, any further questions? It is a good discussion, and that was a really good discussion at STAT the other day. I was glad I was had a chance to listen in on that as well. Any further questions out there? Yeah, this is um, Kathleen. I, I have a, a question about this around the next steps. 
and it follows up on the suggestions that came from Stack. How how will the timeline that's laid out for this, how will it incorporate the Stack having an opportunity to preview this and weigh in on it? And then prior to us seeing it, what's that um, cadence of it coming forward both to Stack and, and for us? So that, that's one question I have, and then I have a separate unrelated follow-up question. That's a great, yep. Um, Jennifer, could you actually go to that timeline slide and I'll, um, this was where I was gonna turn it over to Aaron. Oh, okay, if, you, if you're already gonna cover that in another part, that's, that's fine. Okay, All right, which slide do you want, Rebecca? Uh, go forward towards the end. There you go. Okay. Aaron, do you wanna go ahead and cover this quickly? Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, um, commissioners. Um, I'll, I'll can go over this um, quickly because uh, even after we talked uh, uh, with Stack, we, staff went back and, and made even more adjustments um, based on that discussion. So, but wanted to start us off with um, this is the the timeline that re envisioned taking a, you know sort of that thirty thousand foot view on all, including things that we've recently accomplished and then what's um, yet set before us. So um, we start off that timeline with the great work that was already accomplished in terms of updating um, those guiding principles and those very important initial conversations with our planning partners, our TPRs and MPOs that, that primed the pump um, and had them begin to think about updates to their 10 year plan, um, what kind of um, project uh, adjustments need to be made and, and what's the correct sequencing uh, uh, as we move forward in building those new, that new set of, of year one through four projects. And so you see that those, those items taking place in that November and December timeframe and now we find ourselves in the January timeframe where we're having this uh, initial fiscal constraint discussion, which um, will take us into February. Um, and so you'll see, um, ideally we'd, we'd bring back to you an, an updated version of this uh, timeline that was based on a lot of the stack discussion and discussion here. Um, and then you'll see also that second round of TPR and MPO, um, discussions in terms of, of, of our planning partners really getting into the, the nitty gritty and, and looking at what, what projects get pulled forward into years, the new years one through four. That, um, not, uh, that taking place really um, in, in some degree in January, but really taking, uh, taking place, I declare majority in February and now March. Um, and that the joint TPR meetings probably sliding a month and going into February and March. And then um, this transit outreach, um, checking in again to make sure that our transit agencies and those transit projects align well with, um, with the year one through four um, set of priorities. And so you'll see those adjustments um, next month. Um, and then uh, a couple of things that will be coming before you, not only that fiscal constraint, um, that, that second round of fiscal constraint discussion that'll be coming for you, but then we'll move into um, the work that's been um, ongoing uh, in terms of developing that GHG mitigation policy and those initial, that initial discussion on those strategies uh, in the March timeframe. Um, and so you see if you go down now to some of the internal pieces um, that staff is working on in terms of making sure that we're properly identifying and working on that definition of regionally, uh, regionally significant projects and identifying um, those regionally significant projects as, re as um, folks on our modeling team are beginning to develop that baseline statewide model run. Um, and so that those conversations are going on um, as, we, as we speak. Um, and so before I, I round out this, um, this slide and move us into the next slide where we'll get into a little bit more on the GHG model run, I just wanted to, real quick, let me, let me finish, yeah, yeah, thanks. 
Um, just wanted to say that um, according to this time frame and all the the steps that that are that are set before us all, um, we're looking at bringing forth a draft um, ten year plan in about the June the June time frame, and that's where we've that's where that's where we're set up um, that's where we're set up now. So yeah, now we can go to the the next slide. Thanks, Jennifer. So. Um, Frida were to unpack a bit the 10 year plan modeling pieces. So um, per that that uh, GHG rule, which commission uh, adopted last month, we will be required to update the plan and um, and make sure that the, the plan um, is, is in compliance with those GHG uh, reductions that are set forth in the in the rule. And so again, staff is doing that work now, um, updating our travel model for better uh, evaluation of the plan. And then we've had discussions with each one of our CDOT regions to make sure that we've got our projects um, correct, we've got descriptions correct, um, doing that sort of background initial work um, that then goes into that baseline, that baseline model run to make sure that we're all starting off with uh, the, the most accurate project descriptions as possible. Um, and then our modeling team and our planning team um, work working together um, with our MPOs in separate uh, in separate working groups on on modeling and the mitigation and those uh, conversations are also um, continuing to to uh, continuing to um, uh, move forward. And then lastly, the the point on modeling is um, this this internal work that we're we're, we're coming uh, coming to an agreement on that that key definition of regionally significant projects. And, and once um, we have that um, draft, we're able to, to share that also with our, their, our, our planning partners for, for their input as well. Uh, so I think that rounds out um, those two slides and the conversation. So thank you so much for um, um, listening and I will I'll turn it back over to Rebecca, to close us out. Mr. Brackey, did that answer your question? And I believe you had a second one as well. Yeah, thank you. That was wonderful. I really appreciated being able to see that the timeline holistically and all all those steps. And for the ones where it's SAC and TC, my understanding is that would go to if it's a draft, it would go to stack for formal consideration before it comes to us. That's kind of the process. So thank you so much. This is wonderful to lay it out this way. It's really helpful um, for me. So. So thanks. Um, my other question has to, uh, to do, it's a related topic, obviously a lot in the news um, about all of our increase in crashes across the state and that we're, we're not in, headed in the direction to accomplish our safety goals. Unfortunately, we're headed um, the other way. So I was wondering as the information comes forward, is there any way to denote somehow any of the projects that are on the 10 year plan that would um, be particularly located in a high crash corridor, a corridor location that has a high number of serious or fatal crashes. Is, is some way to convey the safety component of the project as well? I'm not, you know, obviously the list is the list. <laughs> I want to stay there. That's our North Star. But somehow to be able to um, identify the um, safety components of these projects. I got asked a question recently at a public meeting, how is the 10-year plan or the next slate of projects going to help us achieve our vision zero safety goals? And my response was safety is integral to all of the projects that we do and they're all, it's, it's a foundational component, but I couldn't look at the list and be able to articulate any one project or another is particularly related to crash reduction. And so I just was curious if that might be something that's just additive information going forward to help clarify the broad set of benefits from these projects, including um, helping to address safety. So thank you. I'm so, so glad you raised that, Commissioner Bracky. I, I see our chief um, has a perspective here to share. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Yes, Commissioner Bracky, you, you kind of 
hit it on the head when you said that a lot of it's interwoven and, you know, some projects, obviously, you know, if we do passing lanes or, or shoulder improvements, um, those are definitively um, safety projects. But, you know, even congestion relief projects can have a safety component because we stop having the traffic jams and the and the secondary crashes when, you know, cars come around the corner and all of a sudden there's stalled traffic in front of them. So it's it's difficult. I think we could go through the 10 year plan and say, oh, yes, this is this is shoulders on Highway X or this is passing lanes on Highway Y. Um, but, you know, we try to focus on safety on, on every project that we do. Okay, and I and I understand that. I think um, Marissa also mentioned in the chat that safety is defined in the project fact sheet. So that's a great place if that if the fact sheet could hi highlight it. Again, recognizing yes, it's integral to everything we do, but there's also some locations like we're called out in the media today that have a, a particular corridor that has a particular high number of um, serious injury or fatal crashes. So just if it's in the fact sheet, that would be helpful just to be able to, to highlight that, that it's another important part of this set of investments. Yes, good points. Agree, and you know, one, uh, another piece to this update is I think we will have a narrative similar to how we did with the last plan. There won't all just be tables, but I think we need to tell a bit of a story. And I think this is a really good point on reflecting on the kind of moment in time where we're now where we're really seeing this uptick in, in safety issues and fatalities and being able to better, perhaps better tell that story as we talk about the updates. So I'll, I'll look at that as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions out there? Cause I can't see them. Are there questions? I think uh, Commissioner Vasquez and then myself. Okay, Commissioner Vasquez. Yes. And then Commissioner you. Garcia. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Hall. Um, um, regarding being asked in public about safety uh, and CDOT's response, I think it's incumbent on all of us to start out with, uh, it's everybody's responsibility. Human behavior uh, is difficult to control. And yet in the face of that, CDOT is making these uh, efforts in their projects to address safety. And I don't know if all of you agree, but um, it's just like when we're talking about the greenhouse gas reduction rulemaking, human behavior is very difficult to uh, direct uh, from the point of view of uh, the Transportation Commission and CDOT. And that's not opting out, but it's putting back on people their responsibility to help uh, turn the tide on this terrible statistic. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, Commissioner Vasquez, that's such a good point is because um, we always, I think we always in all the projects, safety is, a, is something that CDOT is always considered as top of the top of the list, but it's, but it's human behavior. It's just like, I think so often this, when we had so much ice in the, in the tunnel or in the canyon, um, there's no reason everybody has to drive really fast and really close together, but they do it anyway. And that's why we had so many pileups in the, in the canyon. You come around that corner and there's ice because the sun doesn't hit it. And it's, it's really hard to, uh, we, we, I think CDOT makes a really strong effort to take safety and, and, and congestion is a, another way to, to, you know, to have additional capacity, but people just are not stopping and thinking. They just come barreling around that corner and they hit ice. And so we have those 15, you know, 19 car pileups. And, and um, it's, it, it's so hard to, it's really hard to legislate brains. And gosh, we just are getting a population that think if they're in an SUV, they just can drive as fast and they're gonna be safe and, and they're not. And um, it's, it's really frustrating when you see those numbers because so often, so much of it could have been avoided if they just do some thinking and more careful driving. And um, yeah, you've you nailed it, uh, Commissioner Vasquez. It's hard to hard to hard to do something about human behavior. That's for sure. Uh, Commissioner Garcia, I think you were next. Yep. I think Commissioner Stanton was next. No, okay. go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. Uh, thank you. 
A question for Rebecca on that uh, one slide where you showed the next four year funding. My understanding is Stack is looking for allocations for um, that next four year period. And when might that come forth? They sure are, <laughs> Commissioner Garcia. And I, I totally understand the impetus because we're, we're trying to advance the plan along and have these TPR meetings. Uh, and certainly the, the regions and stack would like to kind of know those numbers to have those discussions. So that's what I'm working very hard to deliver uh, is to get, um, get some numbers in place, uh, bring them to you all next month, but also um, arm the, the regional directors um, with the information they need. So I'm tracking that pretty closely in the timing of each TPR meeting. So the, sh the short answer there is, absolutely by our February discussion, we'll be showing some numbers. Okay, Commissioner Stanton. Uh, Commissioner you. Garcia, you're muted. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Sorry, Sorry and that's coming from the slide that you showed that had all the different funding mm -hmm. um, coming through uh, from the various sources. Yep. Great, okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I wanted to follow up on what Commissioner Bracky said, and also I appreciated Engineer Harrelson's overview about safety being embedded in projects. If we take as a given that our Colorado colleagues will be driving worse, there will be more impaired driving over the next 10 years, is there a way to build into some of these projects or into our budget proactive ways such, because if we do a cost benefit analysis, if one person or one truck gets hit in a TIMS traffic incident maintenance uh, management situation, that life either being hurt or killed tips the balance. And I'm not sure sometimes that we're putting that in. I think we need to take as a given that our drivers will be making bad choices for the next 10 years. And I would suggest that we try to get in more articulated trucks, more variable message boards, more uh, things that our engineers can guide us to. But uh, I think we need to be more proactive and put uh, whatever, $100 million over 10 years down on this to get back to what Commissioner Brackett was saying. Because I know it's, it's embedded in our projects. We're trying to build safer highways, but I just don't think it's making a bigger difference and we need to do more. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Stanton, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the, it, there are a million little things we can do. We, we are uh, trying to buy more attenuator trucks for our, our uh, maintenance crews and our engineering crews. So while they're out on the road, they'll, they'll be protected. Um, you know, that one of my favorite little measures that we can do on, on rural resurfacings is a, um, we, we can do this technique called cold in place recycling, where we, um, you mill up the uh, existing surface of the road and you, you add a rejuvenating agent to it, which is essentially, you know, more binder or more oil, and then you lay it down, uh, immediately and then, um, then you pave two inches over the top of that. Um, the beauty of that operation is that it, it tends to widen the road by about a, a couple feet. So if you've got a 24 foot uh, wide rural road, um, when you're done, you have a 26 foot rural road. And that extra foot, it, it's not really a, a full shoulder, but it's, it's an extra margin of safety. Um, there's things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I can use my bully pulpit to, uh, to advocate those sorts of things, but that's, um, you know, you, you mentioned benefit cost. I know our um, traffic safety folks uh, use benefit costs to, to, to um, steer funding to, to certain little projects, um, you know, trying to predict the, the, the property damage and the, the loss of life and, and justifying that um, money gets spent on the, the areas where it will, uh, cause the most benefit. Um, we, we've got that set up, but you know, we can always do better.
Okay, any any further discussion on that item before we move on? Yeah, this is Thank Commissioner you. Hart. I've got a quick uh, question. I think uh, Commissioner Beatty uh, does too. Okay. Uh, just a, 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 a suggestion is, I think all of us would like to dig deeper into this question of safety. Obviously, we've been tracking uh, these issues and, uh, you know, and then having to come out uh, in the press recently is no surprise to us, but uh, it definitely drills home uh, one of the many things we're trying to do. And I'm hoping that we can, one of the things that we can analyze it from is a risk management perspective, which basically again, goes into and analyzes uh, these accidents, particularly the fatalities, analyzes them uh, based upon the evidence after the fact to determine what is either the evidentiary cause or the perceived cause uh, of the various types of accidents, because then we're using a logical basis to say, um, you know, here's the kind of things that we should be emphasizing. And frankly, I, I, I think that we've talked about it quite a bit. All of us, I think, have noticed this uh, interesting um, evolution that we're going through uh, in this COVID period where everybody's mad about everything and everybody, and they seem to be taking it out on the roads. And, uh, you know, when you used to see people speeding 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, now you see them 20, 25 miles an hour at the speed limit. Uh, there's something going on, and it's beyond, uh, you know, engineering will handle some of it, but it's beyond that. And I liked uh, Rich Zamora's comments and some of the comments from my fellow commissioners after that. Education, I think, is going to be a huge component. And uh, if you're in the realm of politics, what you understand is you don't just say something, you say it over and over and over again in every simple way that you possibly can. And that's one way that we can proactively try to tackle uh, some of these things. But I'd love that uh, risk management analysis of the causes, a deeper dive into what we think about it, particularly what staff thinks about it, and then a, uh, you know even a more in-depth conversation on not only the, edu the engineering uh, aspects, but the educational pieces we might be able to get engaged in. Okay, Commissioner Beatty. Yeah, mine's just a quick comment on the safety. I mean, most of these come down to uh, the human human factor of it and again the education i agree and enforcement uh, i know for construction zones i've wondered we can't do speed you know speeding tickets by camera but i think that would really help in especially construction zones you could set up a camera give a warning sign of their speed that they're speeding and the next one would give them a ticket um, some things like that, if there was a way to get legislation to allow us to do enforcement through, um, especially the speeding pieces um, by camera, rather than always having to have, you know, state troopers or law enforcement on site all the time to do that enforcement. Um, because without enforcement, no law, no matter what, or no, no improvement's gonna happen until people realize there's a penalty for for going too fast or um, doing things that they're not supposed to be doing while driving ignoring you know pedestrian walk crosswalks or or whatever and that goes across all factors you know people jaywalking where they're not supposed to be on roads and then thus getting hit or all those different factors so without that personal responsibility we can design the best roads and somebody's still going to do something and and have a fatality or an injury so I agree we should do everything we can with our design and implementation of our, our transportation projects, but it still comes back primarily to the individual and we just need to make sure we design good sound projects in a cost effective manner so we can address it statewide and not get sucked into just one specific area or, or things when we're so short on funding on a statewide basis. So thank you. Okay, um, any further comment, uh, Don, Commissioner Stanton? Yeah, I just want to follow up. I think uh, Commissioner Beatty made a really good point about keeping this on a statewide basis. Another thing, Rebecca and team, since we have our guiding principles and safety is supposedly number one, is there any way as you go forward to look at the next four years to try to build in more specific safety slash 
things that can do risk management, as was stated earlier, to get us some more concrete things in there. I realize that everything's got safety embedded in it, every project, but I, you know, we're going to be seeing the same uh, record again next year because it, I don't think it's going to get any better. And we're just going to have more people and more frustration. And I remember somebody mentioned improving congestion. That does help reduce some of the uh, frustration level. Thank you. Good comments. Those are all really good comments. And, and clearly, we all care a great deal about safety. And oh, that's a tough one, because <laughs> that involves human human decision making, that's for sure. So if there's no further questions on this, Rebecca, anything further you want before we go into the MMOF distribution? No, thank, thank you, Commission. That's some really good conversation here. I appreciate it. It's good food for thought as we look at updating the plan. Good conversation. Thank all of you commissioners, it's very good. Okay, let's move into the MMOF distribution plan. And as you all remember, we have discussed this several times and tomorrow there will be um, a resolution in order to uh, complete that. And so if, if Rebecca, Amber, um, if you're ready, we'll go into that discussion. All right, so that is going to be me. And we will just wait for the um, slideshow to get pulled up here. Um, as an intro, As an introduction, um, as Jennifer takes a minute to get this pulled up, um, we have been working on the MMOF um, formula distribution for many months now. And if you can all recall, this was this is based on looking at the previous MMOF formula um, that was established and adopted, well, established through recommendations of the subcommittee and then adopted by TC. And then with um, the passing of Senate Bill 260, we have new requirements and a new intention with that funding. And that is what we are here to talk about. Next, perfect. So the original MMOF program was created under Senate Bill 1 in 2018, and it required all funding to be split with, for MMOF funding, 85% for local projects and 15% for CDAP projects. The statute required that the TC adopt the formula to distribute the local funds to MPOs and TPRs in consultation with the stack, track, and bicycle and pedestrian advocates. An MMOF advisory committee was formed in 2019, and this committee consisted of representatives from stack, track, Bicycle Colorado, Walk Denver, the State Unit on Aging, the Colorado Commission on Aging, and the Denver Streets Partnership. The committee recommended a formula that was adopted by the Transportation Commission in, the, in June of 2019, and that formula was used to distribute the original state funding um, in the amount of $76 million. Next slide, please. So the original distribution formula from the Senate Bill 1 money was based on 10 criteria that were generated using five-year estimates uh, from the ACS data, which is census data. They included total population, school-aged children, disadvantaged population, housing and transportation costs, zero vehicle households, transit revenue miles, unlinked transit passenger trips, job counts, bike crashes, and pedestrian crashes. Next slide. So this past summer, when Senate Bill 260 was adopted, there were a few changes that were made um, that expanded the MMOF program goals to improve multimodal access and options for disproportionately impacted communities. Disadvantaged or disproportionately impacted communities are census block groups where more than 40% of households are either low income, minority, or experiencing housing cost burden. And this is different than the previous criteria, so we're calling it out. Senate Bill 260 also expanded funding eligibility for greenhouse gas emission reduction projects and provides a steady stream of funding of $448 million over 10 years. So why are we looking at updating the original formula? 
a few, the reasons are one data issues. So the 2016 criteria of those 10 factors cannot readily be replicated with more recent data that meets the requirement to look at disadvantaged population um, and to reflect the housing cost burden criteria. Also, we found that bicycle and pedestrian crash data by county cannot be validly summarized by TPR. So we have a solution for this and it's reflected in the proposed formula. In September, stack and staff recommended formula updates that will align the distribution formula with the criteria of Senate Bill 260 program goals, use more readily available and valid criteria data, and update all the criteria data to the most recent year available. The current available information is the 2019 five-year estimate. And then new criteria is recommended in this formula for disadvantaged community populations, disabled populations, and populations age 65 plus. Next slide, please. Okay, so the Multimodal or MMOF Advisory Committee reconvened in October of 2021 and recommended updating the local MMOF distribution formula criteria and weighting. This was then brought to track and stack who concurred with the multimodal options fund advisory committee's recommended formula and track also made an additional recommendation that the formula be re-examined when more recent data is available, such as the 2020 census data, which will be out at the end of 2022. So we've created a chart here for you to make it easier to understand the differences between the original criteria and the new criteria for this formula um, recommendation. So in the right hand column, you see the 10 factors for the original criteria. And then in the left hand column, you'll see the new criteria and how it's reflected. The key changes that we're looking at with the new criteria is the DI community population, which again is low income, housing cost burden or minority, disabled population and 65 plus. And you can see that's a shift from what was in the original criteria numbers three and four. So now we have three, four and five to cover those areas. The other changes is looking at maintaining bicycle crashes and pedestrian cash crashes, but rather than using the county data, which we found was not the most reliable um, data, that we wanted to look at using actual point data, which is more accurate and reflects those pedestrian and bicycle crashes more appropriately. Next slide, please. So the other piece of the formula recommendation is a split. The advisory committee recommended continuing the 81% urban, 19% rural, and the way that that works is the amount of money that comes in, you do the immediate split urban and rural off the top, and then you apply an urban formula and a rural formula to each of those segments. So the rural formula criteria, the recommended changes were to eliminate unlinked passenger trips, which is a count of passenger boardings of transit vehicles. And then to shift the weighting of the criteria to the new disabled and 65 plus populations. And we'll show you this in the table in one second. It's a little bit confusing on this slide. And then for the urban criteria, the change was very minor. It's generally unchanged from the Senate Bill 1 formula. The same DI communities weighting for disadvantaged populations as the original formula. You'll see on the next slide here that the urban formula has the same weighting for disadvantaged populations, but no longer has additional weighting for age 65 plus and for disabled population. So when we look at the urban formula first, you can see there's no weighting here under the disabled population or the 65 plus. However, the 10% that was for the disadvantaged populations previously is maintained at the same weighting. And then when you look at the rural formula, 
you can see unlinked passenger trips and jobs, there's blanks. However, the committee felt that adding 15% weighting for both disabled and population 65 plus was appropriate and met their needs. Um, and then they, elim yeah, they eliminated the unlinked passenger trips. Next slide. Here's the original formula where you can see disadvantaged population 10% in the urban, which is now DI communities, and then the rural maintain their 15% weighting through all of the disadvantaged pieces and then remove the unlinked passenger trips. Next slide, please. So the additional recommendations from TRAC, as I mentioned earlier, is um, there were two more pieces. The, these pieces were to encourage MPOs and TPRs to make multi-year commitments of MMOF funding to enable new transit services. Transit operating is an eligible expense under the Senate Bill 260 um, MMOF funds. And TRAC is recommending that that be promoted to the TPRs and MPOs for those project types. And then they also requested that CDOT provide each MPO and TPR an annual projection of the MMOF funding that would allow them to support their ability of making longer term transit operations commitments so that if there was a project that was a three year project, they would, they would know that they had the appropriate amount of funding and could be comfortable making that type of decision. Next slide, please. Okay, so MMOF funding and how it will be um, distributed. Rebecca, are you going to take this slide? Uh, sure, the main intent of this slide is to just let commission know these dollars are arriving. Um, the way that the MMOF program works with Senate Bill 260 is pretty heavily front loaded. So we see a, a sizable amount of dollars in these first two years, and then it, it really starts to taper off. Um, so right now, uh, as of actually um, June of 2022, we'll have uh, about 212 million available to distribute to the locals. Uh, so that's why we're bringing this to you now so that we can start preparing guidance. Um, we'll plan to do a webinar and make sure that our partners um, in the TPRs and the MPOs have the certainty they need to go ahead and, and start getting these dollars spent. Uh, so this just sort of breaks that down. And then we discussed last month uh, reducing or, but applying a 2% ad admin fee. So you see that dollar amount there. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to close it out? Um, so this is the second to last decision related to MMOF, but this would close out the discussion around uh, the local funding distribution because commissions already decided on the match and the admin funding. This is the heart of it though, the local distribution formula. The final piece is that we receive, uh, we being CDOT, 15% of the MMOF dollars. So as we talk about the plan and in those future discussions, we'll br be bringing you uh, more information on the staff's thinking on that source of dollars. Uh, but that's why this is in your packet now. Uh, you know, we're, I think Amber's done a great job of sort of explaining all the work that's gone to get us here and that we are closely watching that census data, but um, we have to uh, provide some guidance in the interim. So with that chair, I, I think Amber will take all the, all the hard questions on this one. Okay, Amber, are you ready? I don't see anybody's hand up, but there's some questions from commissioners. I'm looking here. Um, to see if I do I see any questions out there? Um, I don't see any. I don't see any questions. Well, we have discussed it at length, and we do have a, a committee, and this went through stack last week. I think they took a look at this too, didn't they? If I remember right. Yeah, they did. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions. Um, Mr. Garcia, he's he's there oh. on my screen. Oh, is he? Okay, I'm sorry, I don't see him. Okay, Commissioner Garcia. Uh, no question, just uh, thank you for a great presentation and thanks to the committee also. Please send their, uh, send gratitude to them for all their hard work on this. Thank you. 
I do. I do see you now. Yeah, just was a little slow coming up. So I finally got my screen back. I apologized to all of you for that last presentation. I, all I had was your faces and I didn't have anything else. So um, any other um, comments from anyone regarding the MOF, MMOF formula so we can pass this resolution tomorrow? I don't see any. So Amber and Rebecca, I guess you did such a good job that we'll move on. And Amber, we have you for the, the, the Bustang Pegasus update, which I'm anxious to hear. I think this is such a good program coming up. So Amber, we'll go forward with you. All right, great, thank you. I feel a little bit like Rebecca today. Usually she is on a lot during these workshops. And, and you're on a lot today. You're I on know. a lot today. Um, so this is really an update. It's just an update informational item and to take questions if you have any on our current busting family of services and what we have going on here in the near future. And then a little bit of a look back on um, how we're doing with busting. So we'll start out with Pegasus today. This is our most exciting upcoming service that will be kicking off here in 2022. So just as a little bit of a review, um, in April of 2021, the Transportation Commission approved the Pegasus service as a transportation option. Pegasus will be an express bus service operating Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and holiday Mondays between Denver, Union Station, and Avon. And you can see here to the right on the image the route that it will take and the stops that the Pegasus buses will make. This service will operate 11 passenger vans using the Mountain Express lanes in Clear Creek County when they are active. So that will enable us to provide quick, efficient, affordable service throughout this corridor um, on those really high traffic days and hopefully um, alleviate some congestion and reduce some greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. So Pegasus was originally scheduled to begin in February of this year. It's now planned to kick off on April 29th. And the reason that there's a delay really has to do with supply chain issues. Our vans were ordered in June of 21 and eight of the 10 vans were delivered for a conversion in November of 2021. As you know, pandemics are interesting things and it's really great when you find out um, information like your vehicles were canceled. So in Denver or in December of 2021, we discovered that two of the 10 vans were canceled from the order um, for production by Ford. And as soon as we heard this, staff started working with Davy Coach to order an additional six vans and were able to come up with a solution so that we could kick off the service in full effect in April of this year. So the two outstanding vans are now anticipated to arrive later this summer. Uh, next slide, please. However, we do have a state price agreement with um, a couple of rental car agencies, and we are working to procure vehicles so that we have those backup vans and can ensure smooth service for the traveling public as we roll this out. So the vans will be delivered in March. We'll conduct the training and testing in April, and the service will kick off from Union Station on April 29th. Um, we will make sure to let you know and keep you informed on all of the media and outreach for this um, awesome service, but it's, it's ready to go and we're excited for it to kick off. Next slide, please. So we have a quick busting overview for you for 2021 observations. We know this is a a really important service that the state provides to our state and wanted to make sure that the TC knew that the ridership is holding steady and is returning to pre-COVID levels on par with or exceeding our expectations on some routes. Um, like all transit agencies in the state, we did experience significant impacts due to COVID. However, we are seeing good return to ridership um, as you will see here. The data shows us that continued planning for future expansions and service enhancements is still valid. Um, but like Commissioner Stanton mentioned earlier, we really want to make sure that we are providing services that the state needs and to make sure that those services are sustainable 
um, with options like Pegasus. It's what service are we providing that meets what need? Um, because as the Commissioner Bracky said earlier, also it's there's multiple service service types and multiple needs. So we need to make sure that the services we provide and the services that the agencies provide are actually meeting the need of our state. So on the north and south lines, we are seeing 40 to 46 percent of our pre-pandemic levels for ridership. And our south line is trending a little bit lower, um, 31 to 36%. And I see a typo, it's not 2029, so I apologize for that. We'll get that fixed um, to 2019 levels. <laughs> um, <laughs> CSU students do make up a considerable number of um, our commuting public on the north line and they are in session. So we are anticipating continued great ridership on, on that north line. When we look at the West Line, this is the one that's really exceeding our um, anticipated ridership return. And in December of 2021, we saw 84% of pre-pandemic levels for ridership. So this route is really performing. Um, and the West Line, little bit different service than that North-South Line, is catering to leisure and then essential trip customers. So, um, there's very few commuters on that route on the West Line, um, although that could change in the future if we um, continue to look at how that service is provided, unlike that North-South Line, which really is that commuter route. Um, next slide, please. So we have, I'm, and I know you all see, saw this in your packet, but we just wanted to make sure that you could see the graphs for both the system-wide numbers as well as by route. Um, and Ideally, we would see all of those lines right up there next to each other, but you can see the difference between, let's say, January of 2021, which is the far right column, comparing it to December of 2021, which is the far, I mean, far left to far right. You can really see how that ridership um, in the dark purple is increasing. So we are having that return, return to service. Um, I have a few more slides that just have graphs. And so I'm not quite sure if you'd like to see each of those, but we can go ahead and click through them. And then I believe we are ready for, for questions. Yeah, go ahead and click through them. I think they're all interesting. I was looking at them online, so. Awesome. Yeah. So then we have the north route here, um, a little bit slower return, like we saw in the numbers that we reported on the previous slides, but still moving in the right direction. Um, and if any of you have questions, we, we're happy to take questions as we look at these slides too. Yeah, it's uh, from Gary. Uh, Gary Beatty says, do you have actual riders to capacity and cost per rider for operational cost? That's a did you see that question, Amber? I did see that question, and I don't believe I had that in the notes. Commissioner Beatty, I should have anticipated this based on our conversation <laughs> about busting. Um, let me see if Mike has that at his fingertips. I believe he is on this meeting. While he's looking for that, you can go on to the next slide, I think, and I think you've got the west westbound slide. And then Commissioner Vasquez has a question. Go ahead. Do this. Commissioner Vasquez. Uh, yeah, it was a general question in your planning uh, for the Bustang routes and for Pegasus. I, I'm assuming that there was coordination with local transit so people aren't dropped in a transit desert. Um, and I'm curious how difficult that's been with uh, the Pegasus, standing that up quickly to make sure that people have a way to get to their destination once they get off Pegasus. That is a great question. Um, so Commissioner Beatty, Mike is gonna get that information so I will be able to answer your question. And then Commissioner Vasquez. So we have the inner city and regional bus plan that was a public effort with outreach to the communities that identified the routes for the bus staying services. 
This plan needs to be updated. Um, it's a few years old and we're currently working on a scope of work to, to issue a request for proposals um, to have that plan updated. So we will be updating that plan. As we know from working with all of our agencies, their services change, the pandemic has had significant impacts. And one of um, my own personal items that I would like to see us improve is the continued outreach and communication with all of the agencies as we do our planning. Because you're right, there is not a transit desert. We don't work inside of a vacuum. And there's so many intricacies with the transportation system, specifically transit, when we want to integrate those services um, to make sure that you're not having an hour wait between head times when you get off the bus before you can get to the local service to get where you need to go. Um, and then make also making sure that we make the improvements to the busting and busting outrider routes so that when you do get off of the bus and have to wait or wait for the bus to arrive, you have a bench, you have a shelter, you have an ADA compliant access to, to get to the stop. Um, we are not there yet. And we are aware of that, but that is something that we are consistently working on. And those planning processes will be updated um, within the next year, year and a half, depending on um, what kind of timelines we get back. Thanks, Amber. My question comes from uh, an experience in the 80s in the Phoenix area, trying to get to work by bus uh, mm -hmm. to get out of my car. And it would have taken me three hours to get to work. <laughs> so I'm really sensitive to the fact that when you get off, it doesn't mean that there's a, a way to get to your destination. Yeah, that doesn't quite work, does it? <laughs> okay, Commissioner Hickey. Thank you. My, qu my questions follow Commissioner Vasquez pretty well. I and some others down here, including the uh, PPACG, uh, are very interested in promoting a conversation about regional transit here and exploring options. And that's just preliminary and high level. And but I'm interested in the idea of knowing more about the cost per rider. Those are critical pieces of data, but of looking at how bus staying expansion is considered and does the road have to be clogged like I-70 headed west or can it be an option that would serve, for example, Colorado Springs going to Summit County, the back way, as we call it over, uh, you know, it, up at 24. So I'm interested to know the algorithms you look at to see other areas where bus tank can be expanded and where a local agency could, for example, pick and choose among options. And, um, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about, so I may be treading on toes here, but um, to, to potentially um, choose bus staying rather than creating a new alternative. And so anyway, I'm just very interested in seeing us continue to explore. I love the bus staying it for many purposes and um, I expect it to grow in the future and I'm hoping to see it grow down here. Excellent. Um, so I think that your question is very timely um, as we move forward into the service planning revisit um, because you are exactly correct. I don't believe that right now we have the two main lines for busting, east, west, north, south. There are expansions that could go further east. There are expand. We could go. We're looking at a study going all the way up to the Wy through to Wyoming, as well. So that north route. But I think what you're touching on is where that ridership need is, and then making sure that we're really making the most efficient system possible. I think the other piece that's important as we look at that that I did have a conversation with Commissioner Beatty about is the fiscal sustainability of being able to continue to run these services. So as we bring online the mobility hubs, as we expand busting and busting outrider, we need to make sure that we've got solid footing on understanding that how we'll pay for these services moving forward so that we're truly creating that foundational piece of the transportation system that our residents and visitors can rely upon as they make their decisions for their own lives. 
um, being a one car family, a no car family, where your house is, <laughs> those types of, of decisions so that we can really increase that mode shift if possible. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Commissioner Bracky, I think you have a question. Great, thank you. And I definitely wanna start by saying thank you to Amber and the entire team that's working on transit for CDOT. It's really phenomenal, the work that you're doing and the progress that has been achieved um, since we've come on board. I mean, it's really been phenomenal to see the, um, as you're showing the bouncing back or bouncing forward for uh, bus staying coming through the pandemic. And then really exciting to hear about Pegasus and these new uh, routes that are coming on. So I really appreciate all your you're doing. Um, I definitely hear from friends and family and neighbors who are starting to use Mustang again from Northern Colorado to get to Denver and really appreciate the service, the quality of the service and the reliability of the service uh, really sets it apart from a lot of other um, um, options for people and is certainly uh, relied on by a, a lot of people. Um, I, I was also glad to hear you describe the um, planning process sounds like it's going to come up around service planning and you're probably plugged in with the um, North Front Range MPO is also doing a regional plan up for transit service. So it would be interesting to learn kind of how those different initiatives are coming together and um, supporting each other. And then um, intriguing to hear you mention the service up to Wyoming as well. I've definitely heard uh, the need for that in different public meetings, um, particularly people needing to get to um, medical services um, and VA veteran services in Wyoming. So thank you for looking into that. Um, my question has to do with the new service that um, Outrider service that has, I don't know if it started yet or is starting soon to Greeley and Sterling. And if that has started, I'm just curious how it's doing or if it hasn't started yet, if you could just remind me of the start date. Yes, I want to make sure that I am thinking of the right service. So Mike is chatting me right now. Um, okay, so I also wanna to touch base while Mike is responding here to me that um, region four needs definite kudos for their partnership and working on the um, Wyoming DOT, Colorado DOT, feasibility study for that service expansion. So thank you for the recognition of all the hard work, but I also want to make sure that credit is given where it is due. So thank you to, and all of the regions honestly have been outstanding in helping us move forward this, this transit vision and all of the work that we've been doing. So with that said, um, come on, Mike. Um, the, I believe the Sterling expansion has not started. No, that's correct, Amber. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're still, sorry about that. <clears throat> we're still waiting for uh, uh, supply chain issues on that too, that we have, uh, we had uh, uh, body on chassis vehicles for those, uh, for the entities operating those lines. And uh, uh, unfortunately there was, they, they were part of a Ford uh, factory recall. So, I think we got one back now, but we're still waiting for the other three to come back so we can start the uh, uh, Sterling route and and the uh, um, and also the Trinidad to Pueblo route. So we hope to have that going. Uh, we hope to have that launched by April. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the update and and definitely understand all of the challenges with the supply chains and vehicles. So thanks for all you're oh. doing. Okay. Mike, do you have the ridership information for Commissioner? Yeah, Irving? yeah just a minute. Thank you. While he's looking for that, <clears throat> Don Stanton made a good comment on the on the chat box that he appreciated Amber Blake's statement <clears throat> about sound financial detailing to support transit multimodal. And he appreciated Commissioner Beatty's excellent points and they are, we always have to look at the bottom dollar. And along with that, while we're waiting for Mike to come back, I, it was really interesting on how the westbound uh, was so strong when it started and it rebounded very quickly. That's really interesting to see. It rebounded very quickly. So this, this direction, people like to ride the bus, it's clear. 
<laughs> for some reason. I think I think everybody thought the westbound would be the least used, and it's the, it's been very well received from the day it started, which is interesting. So, so whatever Mike's ready. Yeah, um, I can. Uh, you know, basically, right now the north and south lines. Uh, basically uh, using um, actual riders to capacity. You know, each bus has 51 seats. So uh, the average, we're doing about 10, uh, we're getting about 10 passengers per bus uh, right now while we're going through our, uh, but that, that, that's up from about six, from six months ago. Um, so it's, it's, it's coming back. The West Line is a little more, you know, uh, it's a little more, we're having issues there. We're at about 60% overall capacity on those vehicles. Um, the costs are uh, more in line with what we were doing pre-COVID uh, since we're back at 84% of that. Um, I, I'm trying to get you the actual cost per rider for the, for operations. I, you know, i trying to get that here from my folks but um, well Mike if you need to you can send that to us individually okay. you can send All it right. out to the commissioners or send it to Jennifer sure. and have okay. it put out to us rather than you try to do it instantly because uh, yeah. that would be something we'd all be interested in so you can sure do I can I'll be, I'll be happy to get that for you right away yeah and then get that to Jennifer and she can get that out to us it's important all right great and I, and I think Commissioner Vasquez I think you had another question Thank you. I have a follow-up question, Amber. And again, it's a, one of ignorance, so educate me. Um, so is there uh, mapping done for uh, bus staying connection to local transit? Um, is it um, coordinated to the point you have one-stop shopping to be able to buy a bus staying ticket and a local transit ticket to get to your ultimate destination? Is this something in the future you're thinking about? So that's a great question. Um, and I will say the answer is yes and no to the mapping piece. So currently what we're trying to do is get GTFS data for all of the systems so we can overlay all of it. So we're working on taking the information that we have that looks at the busting routes as well as the local routes. We don't have a comprehensive data set yet, but we are working towards that. Um, the other piece that you asked about the one-stop shop, um, what the CDOT, DTR, and the Office of Innovative Mobility um, have recently per written an RFP and awarded a contract to do what we're calling Connected Colorado, which would be a one-stop shop for buying a buying a bus ticket. So you could say, I want to go from here to here and it will calculate, here's the fare that it's going to cost. Here's the trip that you can take. So you could really do the one-stop shop and have access to all transit agencies. That being said, once it's developed, we need to get the buy-in and all of the agencies to sign up with that system um, for it to really be the dream that we have, that, that vision to come to life. So in the works um, and we are trying to put together all that information. The mapping exercise I will say is I think critical to identifying our gaps because if we see that there's a quarter of a mile gap between services then that would be an opportunity for conversations to see if there could be any sort of changes to either of the routes to get a little bit closer um, because we, we really use that baseline of a quarter of a mile as the maximum amount really anyone want, wants to or will walk between um, modes. Yeah, my questions are targeted of course to make this as easy and uh, frictionless as possible to encourage the ridership uh, we're looking for and to um, enable individuals who may not have the time or the technology or the budget uh, to be able to figure out all of this on their own. So anything we can do to grease the, the, the yeah. route <laughs> to increase transit is I'm sure on your plate of to-dos, uh, but I didn't know how far along you were. Yes, and I will add to that. Um, 
We do have mobility management grants and programs that we admit. So we'd pass through the funds to local agencies where they can do a mobility management grant and do travel training and work with community members to you know, train you how to use the bus because that can be really intimidating if you haven't ridden the bus and learning how to transfer between systems or even routes. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one thing that we are really thrilled to be working with the local agencies on that helps facilitate the, the transition to transit. Yeah. yeah, and that quarter mile, of course, is for able individuals. Right. And, yeah, <laughs> looking at disabled service is a whole nother beast. Exactly, yeah. Good comments, good comments. Uh, Commissioner Beatty, I think you have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit of some of my thoughts after having talked with Amber earlier. Um, I guess it was last week. Um, but the one thing that has always stuck out to me is people mention, oh, with people need it for medical trips and things. And I think the bus staying and this Pegasus service and even the Outrider are not the best fit for trying to, to get people to doctor's appointments, whether it be VA or those things. Um, when you really look at what those people are needing, they're kind of needing a door-to-door a -door usually type service. Um, most of these services are not going to those facilities, so they'd have to interact with other bus services or, or other services to get there. And then you're dealing with doctor's appointments that can run early, late, um, and if they're relying on that to get back home, these types of services are not, I don't believe, the best for especially the medical type things, because I hear that all the time. Oh, we need to get more service into the rural areas for, for them to get to the doctors. And I think part of it is we need to really make sure we're supporting the local agency services that are already doing those things. And if they need expanded service or things to be able to do more of that door-to-door -door type service for those sorts of trips, rather than pulling the bus staying and this Pegasus and Outrider services to try to also fit that piece of, of the transit needs um, statewide. So um, partly tied into what Barbara mentioned earlier, you know, the quarter mile and having to add three miles to your trip or three hours to your trip. Those are all things we have to be very cognizant of and, and our bus staying and our state RAND service needs to be very very focused and not get pulled into all the other things that people mention they want. Um, if we truly want to get more people off the roads, most of it's trying to get the commuters or the recreational travelers to use it on a very regular basis and not just those single one type use services. So just something I want the commission to think about and, and the overall planning for, for these services and how we implement to truly get more people off the roads. All good points. Um, there's three comments that are on the uh, chat box that all are, I don't know, did Karen, did you want to say anything or just just your chat box? Commissioner Stewart? Oh, thank you. I just want to say how impressed I am with the forward thinking of this because this is always a huge challenge for transit agencies is you provide service, but it's not adequate service because of that gap analysis. Uh, you know, the gap that someone says, like Commissioner Beatty just said, I can't take it to go to a doctor's office because there's no flexibility and I, I can only get so far and then I have to get a taxi or an Uber or I have to walk, all of that. Just wanted to give you kudos for the strategy of how do we look at the gaps and how do we fill those gaps? Uh, really, uh, RTD could take some lessons. Thank you. Yeah, those are good points. And and uh, Jessica just commented, what a great idea. Um, Kathleen, did you have anything more you wanted to say? We saw your note here. Yeah, no, I just put in the chat the piece about, I, I agree that financial analysis is really important, but I think we need to look at financial analysis holistically around not just the cost of off offering transit, but the cost and um, of not offering transit. It is expensive, um, but it is very valuable and it, it hits a lot of our key goals for the Transportation Commission guiding principles around uh, economic, economics, access to jobs, equity needs, as well as um, mobility options. So I just think we need to, look, when we start looking at things financially and the cost per rider, 
we tend to look at that differently for transit than we do for roads. And I think if we're going to look holistically at financial analyses, we should be looking at it, um, the pros and, and cons and trade-offs. So that's the intent behind the, the comment. All really good comments. Anything else before we um, and Michael will be getting in touch with us with those numbers? Um, anything else before this was for information only? Amber, anything else you want to add? You thoroughly covered it all. Good. That's great. Okay, that completes um, the agenda. And now it goes to the freight committee, which is Chairman. Uh, Gary Beatty, um, this is your freight committee, and we'll move into the freight committee. Yeah, um, yeah, we have the presentation on the truck parking, so I'll turn it on over to Rebecca, and I don't know if she has others. No. Michelle, I'll um, just say, I'll just say this: we're a little ahead of schedule. Does anybody need to take a quick break before we moved into the committee work? Okay, how about if we take? Let's, a, take let's take a quick break because we are ahead of schedule, which is exciting. And so let's all take a, what, a five minute, 10 minute break? Five minute, okay. Let's take a five minute break and we'll go into the freight committee, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Hey, Don, seeing those wind turbines behind you, I wonder where it's so green. I'm not so green out here where mine are. <laughs> uh, you're right. This is an idealized version. And right behind me is El Dorado Pass where the uh, 115 knot winds came through and we had to get our roof fixed three times. We were the lucky people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah our wind turbines aren't turning today. It's no, not enough wind. So. Yeah. Hey, Gary, how many uh, turbines do you have out in your county? About? Um, I think I think we're around 500 towers. Wow, and you're county. still getting them, right? Yeah, and then there's another one to be built with another 100, and, a little over 100 towers, I believe, that's scheduled yeah. to start construction next year, or this year, actually, they're saying. By the end yeah. of this year, so this get is, stuff. behind me is a it's just a photo of the NREL test site for turbines. Commissioner Beatty, Chair Hall, do you want me to get started? I think we can probably go ahead and get started. Looks like most everybody's coming back on, so. Okay, uh, well, I, uh, I have the job today for this presentation of really just kicking it off and letting Michelle Sherman walk you through this. But uh, this deck is a, is a presentation that uh, has two purposes. One is we wanted to update commission on the work of the, the freight team to create uh, a success and some pilots around a public-private partnership approach to providing expanded truck parking. And we've been doing a lot of work with the city of Bennett that Michelle will walk you through. But very much relatedly, um, we are also seeking the commission's support for uh, some funding tapping our National Highway Freight Program dollars uh, to support this public-private partnership. And I just wanna to caveat this discussion uh, because we don't um, often bring National Highway Freight Program projects to the commission and that's because there's a whole separate process for those dollars where we have a, a call for projects and then we work with the Freight Advisory Committee and it was, um, it was established in PD 703 that because of that process, uh, we would not have to bring individual projects to commission. However, with this one, uh, this is, we're sort of out of cycle because we're not, we're sort of in between the application process. And this is a real near term uh, need to allocate uh, $2 million in both project savings and in fiscal year 22 freight dollars because of the size of that request, uh, we do need to bring that decision to commission. So it's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity for us to update you on this um, partnership anyhow, but that's the reason this is before you um, as an action item. So with that kind of intro, I'll have Michelle walk you through what we've been working on. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Chair Beattie and commissioners. Uh, before I go into my slide deck, I'd like to acknowledge um, two of my teammates who are with me here today. Um, Craig Hurst, who is the freight office manager, and Katie Dawson, who is a project engineer for Region 1. So thank you again, commissioners, for allowing me the opportunity to come and update you today. So we first brought you this concept of a truck par parking public-private partnership back in August. We were just starting off with the project, and we actually got a resounding thumbs up from you that this was something that we were to, to pursue. And We've made great strides in a few months, so I'm so happy to get this opportunity to update you today, not only on um, the details of the progress that's been made, but the process that we've established and um, where we go from here. Next, next slide. So commissioners, just as a refresher, you know, we knew that to really making a, make a meaningful in, um, dent into addressing um, the lack of truck parking in Colorado, we really needed to be creative and innovative and think outside the box. 
um, the same um, avenues or modes of doing um, things to address truck parking, you know, there's only so much of that that really makes um, a meaningful impact. So with that, um, we wanted this project obviously to um, result in tangible results, just not, not another study. We wanted to develop a process that could be replicated throughout the state and various regions um, of CDOT. But we also want this process to be flexible enough to be tweaked um, given a particular either project area, project constraints, challenges, and issues. We also want to document this process. So when Michelle retires, you know, someone can go ahead and, and use this, um, this process. So we are um, documenting this process in a guidebook that will be shared with the regions and others to be replicated. And of course, you know, I am very happy about this and proud because this would really result in CDOT's first truck parking public-private partnership. And of course, something that um, not only CDOT, but our other partners could be proud of as well. Next slide, please. So um, commissioners, since this was our first um, truck parking uh, public-private partnership, um, why did we even hone in on the town of Bennett? So for a couple of reasons, um, we did a truck parking phase one project um, study, excuse me, um, about oh, two years ago. And in that study, it really identified the town of Bennett as an ideal location for additional truck parking, not only as an ideal location, but a, a, a strong, strong need there. Um, it's 50 miles east of Denver on I-70. And then um, also we, um, also have identified uh, land avail available in that area to add 70 new truck parking spaces. Um, with this recipe for success, obviously we have to have willing partners. So when we embarked on this project, um, we had a letter of interest from the town of Bennett um, that really wanted to go on this journey with us and be, be first to be part of this truck parking public-private partnership. And then also, um, loves truck stop. There is adjacent uh, land uh, that they are interested in purchasing from the town of Bennett. So it seems like everything has aligned. And I can go in more detail in a moment. So next slide. So obviously there has to be something in this for everyone. Obviously we know for loves, if there's additional truck parking that's right next to their current um, rest stop, that um, additional patrons will use their amenities. Um, and so that's the win-win for, for loves. So the town of Bennett. So as we've been working with the town of Bennett, their number one request has been um, design um, to replace the bridge, um, State Highway 79 bridge structure over I-70. Um, <clears throat> this bridge creates a bottleneck um, currently within the town as trucks attempt to exit the Love's truck stop. So this has really been one of their number one requests is, has been um, design. Um, a new structure would include shoulders and turn lanes in each direction. I would like to know a couple of things about this, commissioners. This is a CDOT owned um, bridge, but it's not on our priority list right now. And secondly, it is a substandard structure. So I've been working very closely with Region 1, Katie Dawson, to really talk about the design benefits and kind of in scope this project. Um, so some key benefits, it would uh, ease the access um, to the additional 70 parking spaces, and obviously also increase freight mobility and safety. Uh, so I have to caveat this by saying that we do not have construction funds, nor has CDOT committed to the town of Bennett for construction funds. But the reason they are so eager to get this um, design plan set is because they wanna use this to leverage other uh, funding and grant opportunities for future construction. Next slide, please. So what will CDOT bring to the table um, with your concurrence? Um, we really would like to move forward um, and go forth with, with the bridge design. As Rebecca mentioned earlier, it would be funded with National Highway Freight Program dollars. This is certainly an elig eligible project that meets that criteria. And then a couple of things about the, the bridge design. Um, I, the good news is uh, we've been scoping to do the majority of this work in-house with staff bridge. They are very excited to take this project on with us and also some of the specialty units at CDOT. So even though we will be doing some of the work in-house, it doesn't mean that we don't need the money. 
<laughs> because they still need to get paid. And that's just how it works at CDOT. And Katie can answer that much better than I can if you have a question around that. But um, so we are looking more um, as a blended team for this because some of the uh, services or um, things that we need to be done as part of the scope of work cannot be done in-house and we will need to retain a consultant. So a couple of things, um, Commissioner Beattie, you asked me this question and, and I had to go back and look, so I'm ready to answer. Um, you asked um, regarding this design, would it be consistent with the approved PEL? And yes, it will. Um, Commissioner Beattie, there will be some things that will need to be updated um, that were looked at in the PEL, such as the traffic study, but it will be consistent with that PEL. Um, again, see that staff bridge to provide design and looking at a blended team. Next slide. So, oh, I, I need to, to, one more thing to uh, mention, commissioners, is that, you know, we outlined this process steps to achieve an IGA. We just got news yesterday from contracts. Since the IGA will be between CDOT and the town of Bennett, and there is no exchange of monies, um, we could actually um, you go to an MOU as an instrument for agreement, which is a lot less um, uh um, you know, detailed as an IGA. Um, so with that being said, um, we have developed this process flowchart. It was included in your packet. Obviously you can not see this, but we worked very closely with the town of Bennett and others to really articulate what this step-by-step -step process would be should another um, region like to take on or even see our straight office look at another uh, truck parking P3. Um, obviously, we left it flexible enough, again, as I mentioned earlier, to be tweaked um, uh, based on project constraints or issues and challenges. Um, a couple things that this process flowchart does include is obviously an overall schedule, sequential actions needed from each party, so there's no confusion. Everyone knows what, what, they, what they need to do and when, their roles and responsibilities, clear expectations, and we also have included in here opportunities for disengagement if, if, if needed. So next slide, please. So as Rebecca um, mentioned earlier, commissioners, we are out of cycle um, to, to have this project um, move through our current project selection uh, and approval and selection process. So um, with that, uh, we are coming to you to request that we use and advance the National Highway Freight Program dollars um, to fund this design. It'll be funded with a portion of cost savings that we have re realized from other projects and also our fiscal year $22. Um, a couple other things to know, I have brought this project um, to the Freight Advisory Council. They are one of our key stakeholders and this is um, very uh, typical and traditional for us to do and they fully support this project. Um, so again, um, before I move on, I think I'm going to take a moment to see if there's any questions. And also, I think, um, Rebecca, we would like to get a head nod for, in concurrence um, from commissioners that they agree with this funding, because this will be to, uh, included tomorrow in a monthly budget supplement resolution. So with that, Commissioner, question? Commissioner Hickey? Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, do you, do you, um, can you summarize the difference between this project and a P3? It's a P3 like project, but um, if you did that already, I apologize, I missed oh, it. Oh no, no, I did not commissioner. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, so the difference is, is that this, this project is not, um, going through our, our, our P3 um, entity at CDOT. Um, it, it's, it's separate. Uh, it's P3-like in nature is because there are multiple partners, but it will not be handled through CDOT's P3. Okay. I think, I think additionally, we're not signing an agreement with Loves. If we were signing a, a three-way agreement with Loves and the Town of Bennett, it would be a traditional P3. But because our agreement at CDOT would only be with the Town of Bennett, that removes... Uh, P3 by definition, I guess. Okay, and that's that a, makes sense. Yeah, and that's an excellent point, Craig. So we're that, that agreement will be between Loves and the Town of Bennett, so really um, leaves that up to them. Additional questions? 
comments? Yeah, I'm going to jump in. Um, can you scroll the slides back to the one that showed uh, the interchange? Yeah, that one. Um, I just wanted to point out to uh, the commission that just north of the Loves is a King Supers, which serves, I know people from Lyman and out in this area, people will go up to that King Supers because it's one of the closest ones. And when going to basketball games or sports events with schools along the I-70 corridor, a lot of times they'll go there to shop afterward. And this serves probably at least a 30 mile corridor to the east that has a lot of the traffic coming in to shop and things in that area. And off in the northeast quadrant there, just outside the picture area, I don't think it's probably even on this one, it looks like an old picture, but that entire area is being redeveloped or being developed. Uh, there's hotel, uh, REA, uh, electric company, new buildings going in, and then lots of housing being built in that area. So. Um, this is one where I'm hoping Bennett is planning and CDOT is planning that 79 connection that goes north through Bennett and across the railroad. I hope there's some look with uh, Dr. Cog and the region one that they're, they're looking at this corridor because it's an area that they keep adding turning lanes on the 79 highway going north um, to get into the restaurants and businesses that are there. Um, but it, it still does not look like CDOT has a good plan for that corridor that's going to have, I don't know how many homes they're planning to put into that area, but it's going to have very fast growing demand on this court, on this interchange onto the interstate and that uh, state highway going north. So I encourage CDOT to continue to look at that corridor because I have not seen any plans on, on access management for that piece. To, to keep that flowing freely into the interstate. And then I'd like to see the design on that overpass because I think it needs to probably be looked at four lane because I've, I've been through there when people are leaving Denver and going home into that area and the traffic's almost backing up onto the interstate um, on that interchange because it's an uncontrolled uh, interchange, just a four-way stop, so. Those are some of the issues in this area and why it's so important, I think, for us to look at it, in addition to addressing the parking issue for trucks um, because of its location to Denver. So um, just kind of a broader picture for the commission to be looking at and, and how we need to make sure we're planning these, these things outside of that metro area that are, are growing and changing very rapidly on us. Thank you, Commissioner. All great, great points. Commissioner Vasquez? Yes, um, it, it was a great overview of the project. I really appreciate it. But with the distinction between P3 and P3 like, I have a follow up question on how does CDOT guarantee or do they that the partnership between the town of Bennett and Loves will actually result in this additional truck parking? It would seem to me you're uh, we have the cart before the horse in, in doing the bridge design without an assurance that uh, the end result is uh, what you're looking for. Excellent question, Commission, and I should have touched on that, so my apologies. So any day now, we should be receiving a letter of intent from the from Love's Truck Stop that they will work with the Town of Bennett to put in these additional parking spaces. In February, the, the zoning of that, of that land um, will be brought before the Town of Bennett Board for resolution. Thanks for the clarification. Any other questions, comment? So, um, so do we have a general head nod from Commission that tomorrow we're all good to go? Okay, thank you. So one of the things that I promised commissioners when I started this project is to, is to look at any um, opportunities along the way. Obviously, we don't have the funds right now to, to fund another project um, today, but um, we have been in discussions with Richard Azamora, Region 2 RTD, um, on another potential location, um, in, and actually in Pueblo, 
Um, it seems like there are some opportunities there. Um, there is another established uh, truck stop. The, lo the location is intriguing because it's within, the, within a few miles of the pinion rest area, which is temporarily closed. We have been working with Region 2, and Richard, please chime in at any time, staff, and we have a, they have identified a potential willing seller of land in that area. And from just doing a very basic schematic design, we think that we could um, incorporate or install, excuse me, 45 parking space spots. Um, this would be an opportunity that would need to be explored exactly like this one and, and kind of go through the process. But I did want to at least bring this to your attention. Um, that there may be another um, opportunity coming up very soon. Richard, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have anything to add or comment? Um, no, not really, Michelle. As you know, as you stated, you know, we're I'm sorry, my camera's off. I didn't realize. I just turned it on. Um, as you stated, you know, that we've been having troubles with the Pinion Rest area. You know, the folks from that area are well aware of what those troubles are. Um, you know, it's it's really with the the water system. We don't have potable water at rest area. And we also have major issues with uh, sanitary conditions within the rest area um, just because of bad behavior from people. So as an option, we're looking at doing is potentially, um, you know, closing that rest area permanently. Um, nothing has been decided yet, but providing some additional truck parking spaces that we would lose there and, and some even beyond that at this particular location. So the result would be probably even additional parking spaces for truckers beyond what we already have at the Pinion rest area. So. Uh, Commissioner Hart? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm excited that, that you are looking into it for the very reasons that you've cited and Richard just cited, is uh, this is an area where there's a very large demand for uh, uh, truck parking. And so th that would be a very good addition. And it's also very close, as you point out, to the, uh, uh, the closed down uh, opinion uh, uh, rest area. And there's been a lot of discussion in the community about what's it gonna take to uh, increase that. And Richard's hit the nail on the head. The difficulty is, is it's far enough north of town that it doesn't have proper utility connections to it. This would then be able to locate that kind of a dual function in the area. And because it also has that commercial zone, it has that potential for P3. So uh, th this sounds like a very, very good project to take a look at and uh, if I can help in any way, more than happy to help with it. Thank you. Okay, next slide. I think it's just really wrapping up. So a couple of things that um, we will continue, um, obviously is uh, working on the MOU with the town of Bennett um, to co the commissioner's uh, earlier comment, making sure we get that letter of intent. And then, um, you know, kind of thinking about establishing next steps for, for Region 2. That's really all I have today. Craig, anything to add? No, great job. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Beatty, that's the, the main content for the committee meeting today. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to you. All righty. So if there's no more questions or comments about the uh, presentation, um, I wanted to just raise. Um, um, this is Kathleen. I did have a question I put in the chat, but um, uh, on the presentation, if, yeah. if it's okay to ask that before we move on. Yeah. Yeah, I just, again, want to say thanks for all the, the work on it. It was really interesting. Um, I was just curious if there were any additional examples or opportunities, perhaps on North I-25, and if we wanted to talk about them offline, that would be great. I just, I hear a lot about truck parking issues at North I-25 and um, Highway 1 in Wellington. I didn't know if if there were uh, examples along that uh, corridor as well. Okay. Uh, there, there's definitely opportunities. I think uh, we've highlighted a couple in our initial study as well. I've had uh, conversations about um, some projects that are on the 10-year plan is, and, and some that have been applied for through the National Highway Freight Program. The, the key thing uh, that we think we can not only solve there is tr there's truck parking issues, but also when we close down for high winds, where do you put trucks when you shut down the interstate for high winds? And that, that's always tough. You park them on the side, they still blow over. And, and so finding a safe place um, in those scenarios 
it has been key in that discussion and we're going to continue to to monitor that i think the toughest part for cdot always is we don't have land use authority and so you have to have that willing partnership up front to even start those conversations oh, okay thank you yeah if there's anything i can help with if, and that moves forward i in some of the conversations i've had have been with the town of wellington um representatives so um perhaps that's something we could follow up on in the future so um thank Absolutely. you for the information thank you yeah, I think Craig brought up a bit a good point. It, a lot of this comes back to the local zoning and the local communities to to be a major partner um, for zoning and allowing areas that can be turned into that sort of parking with other businesses. So um, that's a key one. Our local communities always have to step up and participate um, the best. So um, wanted to just touch on a topic I brought up before. Um, as we're moving forward into uh, updating the freight plan, um, I'd like the commission to consider and have some discussion with the freight office um, if we need to bring in some additional uh, funding or things to try to do a more comprehensive freight um, study for the uh, front range uh, mobility type study to make sure we're tying in the rail and some of the shifts we're seeing in the distribution and things into the area um, that we may need to bring in a consultant or some additional funding. I know they spent money buying data and things, but uh, sometimes I think we, we may be trying to expect too much out of our limited staff and capacity within CDOT uh, moving into the plan. If we truly want to expand and, and look at how we can address the greenhouse gas emissions with um, fleet, um, the fleets, delivery fleets and things in the metro areas and how we can tie all these different things together um, for the movement of the goods and services. Um, that's just gonna continue to increase in the area as things may shift to rail and how we get it off rail and then into the communities or vice versa. So um, it's something I'd like to discuss and work with the freight office and Rebecca um, and figure out if they need additional funding and what the commission may need to look at helping with on the funding level. Any input from Craig or Rebecca? You know, we've talked briefly before. But... Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Commissioner. I, I think uh... We're putting together a plan right now for how we'll approach the uh, developing the freight plan. And I think we've got some some good ideas and some new data sources. So I'd, I'd love to work more with Michelle and Craig and, and we'll put together what we think we can can cover. Certainly appreciate the, the interest in doing a really uh, thorough job with this next freight plan. It's always a good opportunity to take a look at what's facing us. Uh, I think, oh, sorry. I think a key thing, Commissioner Beatty, is that when the freight plan was first initiated about five years ago by FHWA, that was the first go for everybody. And in the new, uh, in the new transportation legislation, uh, the bipartisan bill, there are details in the freight plan that will be additional from the first time that we did it. And some of those details are based on similar to what you're talking about, the economics and how freight interconnects throughout our state, but also with our neighboring states. And how uh, another one of the requirements is just how freight impacts around um, some of the military installations that we have in Colorado. So there are going to be uh, items that we have to check the box, um, no matter what, as we're updating this next freight plan that will uh, play into that bigger picture as well, that will help us kind of take one bite at a time um, of that much bigger kind of study that we can start building that foundation towards um, and do, do some of that work in house as well. So. I think that could be key for us moving forward. Don. Gary, um, I think you've got a good idea. I think if it was focused on multimodal and trying to get trucks off the road and their, uh, their uh, wagons basically on trains to avoid some of the uh, pounding and the greenhouse gas pollution, is there a chance Rebecca and Craig, that we could get some more data from the Union Pacific um, and from 
BNSF and from the uh, ATA, the American Trucking Association, or, or people like that to give us some more data on what the trend is here in Colorado and how that might affect greenhouse gas reduction? Uh, yes, Commissioner. And in fact, um, I think we've got uh, the right sort of mothership of data. Um, we've been we have a, a few different things we can turn to and have recently been working with a new company. So that's one of the pieces I wanna uh, work with the team better on and understand and, and then be able to, to come up with uh, what we need in addition to that. So data is, is definitely uh, important for sure. Thank you. Sorry about my dog, somebody drove by. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that makes Blaine. me feel better because it's usually my dog that's barking. <laughs> I had a quick question, if that's okay. Um, yeah, go and ahead. I, just piggybacking on the comments on the freight plan, um, that's been a long uh, freight um, planning has been a long-standing um, issue of a lot of interest up here in northern Colorado. And so, again, if there's anything I could do to help with that, or, or I'm sure the North Front Range MPO and others who've been involved in those discussions over the years. I just know it's always a, a hot topic. <laughs> um, so I'm very curious and interested in the learning more about the, the freight plan. Um, the other question I have, and I guess it goes to the data point piece, is um, recently I read the Dr. Cog freight mobility plan, and it has identified um, key locations around the metro area that would be sort of places to intercept freight and then it would get distributed out from there differently. Um, to be honest, it surprised me all the locations that were identified in that plan. And so I just didn't know if how the CDOT freight plan and the Dr. Cog plan would overlap. And then what are those community conversations for areas that have been designated as one of those places to be the freight hub? So just something to consider for a, a resource. Ah, thank you. Yeah, um, you bring that up. And I think that's where I feel we're still missing kind of that overall bigger picture of all the different pieces. And that, that's why I have felt that we need to bring in. Um, there was an Easter Colorado mobility study a little over 20 years ago. And just the data in it, I know to the, the grain storages and things in Eastern Colorado, I look back and how much additional storages and different things have been added all across this area. And then I see the stuff on the front range and it, I, I know we've gotten the new data and I have faith in our, our staff, but I, I think we need a little bit of, number one, we need to bring in the railroads because I think they can play a, a big piece in this uh, Burlington Northern's new rail yard and how that will interact getting onto trucks and then distributed. And like you mentioned, getting stuff off the trucks and more onto train. If we're not engaging in a more meaningful manner with the other entities outside of CDOT through a planning process and a planning document, kind of like the Eastern Mobility Study was done, where you bring in all the different entities to give more input and not just an in-house study. Um, that's where I think we need some of that outside input. Um, the data is great, but if you're not talking with the industry people and the planning of some of these communities, the Aurora I-70 corridor uh, distribution development that's just going in. I mean, you, every time I go by, there's a new warehouse going up along the I-70 corridor. And we need to figure out how we're gonna design and manage our state highway system to support that into the local uh, community uh, transportation system, so. Gary, could I follow up I on what you just said? Um, in the greenhouse, <clears throat> greenhouse gas world of trying to reduce emissions, Rebecca, have people reached out to the UP and BNSF because they're putting a lot of diesel into the air and what entity is supposed to be monitoring that? 
if I could ask um, Kay, Commissioner, if, if Kay Kelly's on, I think you know, that'd be a good question for her. I know there has been some interest in electric uh, locomotives, freight switchers in the yards, but I, I'm not in the middle of that. Yeah, I'm not yeah, trying unfortunately, to. Unfortunately, Rebecca, I'm not. I'm not familiar with the the locomotive aspect of it either. But we can have someone look into that, unless there's someone else on the call who has that info. And Rebecca, the other and Gary, the other piece might be that BNSF and UP have data on how much emissions are reduced by carrying trailers in multimodal setups through Colorado that mm -hmm. might help you and the AQCC, but that's just thoughts. Craig, if you had input. Well, well just to, uh, to to talk about how the work that we have done, we participated in the Dr. Cog uh, freight planning. We're participating in Denver, uh, Denver Denver's freight plan. I think that the state freight plan is meant to have kind of that holistic high level view. And we're supposed to work with our planning partners on developing more regional freight plans. And I think finding that way to, um, you know, work across the region, build that mobility and connectivity is the continued goal of those plans. Uh, I, I believe that the inland port study that we are uh, working on right now is taking a look at some of the impacts of this kind of uh, type of uh, localized development, uh, similar to a, a freight hub that was described, and how that impacts the overall network and the system, and what kind of what kind of role the state needs to play in that situation. So I think we we are building the steps towards a bigger understanding. But again, um, with the freight plans only being a, a FHWA requirement for about five years now, I think we are just uh, kind of building on that information, gathering it, and putting things into action as um, we're completing them. Thank you. Kathleen, did you have a, another question or comment? Yeah, I had a question. Would Will the results of this um, planning process for, for freight also help inform or manage expectations around the location of new interchanges? Um, I think I mentioned a couple months back, I went to a series of like three meetings in in a row in a week at each meeting I went to someone, another community was asking for a new interchange for a new distribution center. And I said, I was afraid to go to the next meeting because it was starting to become, um, you know, too much. And so will, will this help identify and again, manage expectations around that or find locations where we could consolidate access for these distribution centers and, figure out a way to streamline or, or mitigate whether or not we even need a new interchange or could they be co-located somewhere so one interchange could serve multiple distribution centers would that come out of this study or is that too detailed good question commissioner craig what's your perspective on that yeah so so the the inland port study uh, i think a great um version to look at is the, the state of Utah is building an inland port right now. And it's more about, it's not more about one location. It's about the whole system that, that is being built to support kind of moving rail freight from the ports inland into uh, one distribution point, and then having the ability to kind of move it from there for all the reasons that have been discussed in this meeting, GHG reduction, more efficiency, uh, better efficiency at our ports to avoid what we're currently experiencing, you know, as a country right now. So, we have to understand at CDOT, that type of development can come fast as, as we've heard, you know, you drive up and down I-70 east of town and you can see, and I can tell you the numbers are over 20 million square feet just in 2021 um, have developed and developed in that corridor. And, and each one of those is going to have some type of traffic impact. And that's why Bennett was a great um, opportunity for uh, the truck parking expansions because that's where, where, where this is at and they were willing partners. So I, I do think that uh, overall we can um, continue to learn, you know, what the impacts to, that, uh, that CDOT's responsible for. Unfortunately, a lot of the interchange demands are funded by that development. Doesn't mean it doesn't take CDOT time and effort, but absolutely, um, the study that we're looking at will look at the impacts of the traffic and what type of interchange 
and kind of additions to our transportation network would be necessary. Okay, thanks. I mean, anything we can do to try and avoid, again, every company coming in and every one of them wanting their own interchange. I mean, whether it's I-70 or I-25 or wherever, it just, it gets to be, it, it, it does have a holistically impactful um, impact on the system and the traveling public. So I'll take a look at the Utah example that you mentioned. Um, Craig, could you send out the information or I don't know if you're doing meetings with the Inland Port study and things. Oh. I'd like to kind of follow along on the Inland Port things, if you could share that. So commissioners, um, so I'm actually managing that project. Um, we actually have a best practices um, kind of research that, that we did with the consultant um, and looking at other Inland Ports. Um, throughout the country. So we're just pulling that document together right now. So I'd be happy to share um, once that's all pu pulled together. Yeah, I, that's just been an interest in uh, the transport um, development area around Front Range Airport and all those things that have been developing over the many years of discussion. So um, it looks like some of those things are starting to move forward. But, um, wanted to mention for Don, I read an article recently about technology with railroad cars or trains, um, the efficiencies that they're, they're making new advances in the diesel generation on the trains to where they're getting, I think it was eight to 10% more fuel efficient. Um, they're finally getting the bugs worked out of that to keep, keep reducing the, the uh, emissions from trains until they can figure out most likely trains will have to go hydrogen or something where they can plug in and out uh, fuel cells but um, to work efficiently. But within the rail yards, they are talking about using more and more electric within the yards. Those are good Vince. points, thank you. Did you have a question, Vince, comment? No, I was gonna comment about trains too. There's an area in, in Northern California that's a train museum and they allow you to drive a train for a couple of miles. And one of the things I learned there is most trains are electric. The diesel comes in to run a generator to run the electric. And so um, that's where that is. So it's the power they need to run the electric motors. And so most trains are electric and that's surprising because you see them and you see the the diesel and stuff, and you don't you don't put it all together. So just a comment. Hey, any other questions, comments, input on how we work into our next freight plan and meeting those needs? Just to follow on, if I may, to Vince's comment, I didn't know that either. And the beautiful thing about that is it makes them very easy to convert to either alternative fuel or uh, battery operated if they're running on electric motors. So thank you for educating me on that, Vince. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, trains have been running electric for many years. <laughs> and they're getting the efficiency and getting, they were running into a, technology hurdle to get their efficiency even further for better fuel efficiency on them. So they're working on it from the articles I've read and they're finally getting some of those other hurdles jumped over finally to, to get even more efficiency out of the current diesel. And then they are looking at the, the hydrogen or those things where they can plug and play in and out when they get to a station to, to trade out. The big issue is the distances they have to travel and the time it would take to get enough energy charged into a battery is not real feasible for trains at this point. So, right, that's that's uh, in the rearview mirror. Let's let's hope in the future that uh, weight per kilowatt hour is uh, improved dramatically. Yep. All righty. Is there anything else? No other hands or comments. I guess we'll adjourn till tomorrow morning.
eight o'clock, correct? Yep, we'll see everybody. Breakfast. Yep, everybody in the morning at eight o'clock, bright and early, coffee cup in hand. <laughs>